Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we're waiting for a few more minutes just to get started, but thank you for joining us today. And just give us one minute and we will get started. So hello everyone, good morning, and welcome to day one of our first ever virtual NIH Pathways to Prevention workshop, Can Physical Activity Improve the Health of Wheelchair Users? My name is Keisha Shropshire, and I'm the P2P coordinator of the workshop. I will serve as your master of ceremonies to help guide us through today's agenda, presentations, and our discussions. I wanna take an opportunity to thank you in advance to our uh, workshop co-sponsors, um, NCMRR, NICHD, and NINDS, and the planning team, the independent panel, workshop speakers, to each one of you participating today, and to all who have supported our efforts to transition our in-person workshop that was originally scheduled for late March into an all-virtual meeting. So now I want to cover some housekeeping items, um, and I will just roll through the slides now. So in order to access, um, just want to provide you with some tips on access in the P2P workshop website. So once you go to our website, you're able to find, we have workshop agenda on there. We also have a speaker's bio. We have the workshop resources, and you can find all that at prevention.nih.gov forward slash P2P dash PA for wheelchair users. So you might be wondering during our, we're going to have a discussion in Q&A, so we're wondering how might you be able to comment and, um, and provide some questions for the, the discussion and Q&A session. So you can use the WebEx Q&A pod during the discussion session. That is found right in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. You can submit questions to all panelists. And also, if you cannot find that, is we have two different views here. So it's right next to the chat, and you can click on the three dots if it's not showing up, and that will open up the Q&A pod. You can also email us at nihp2p at mail.nih.gov, and then you could also join our conversation on Twitter at hashtag nihp2p. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the WebEx chat pod to send a message to all panelists. And the chat pod is found right next to the participants pod, uh, right at the bottom of the right screen as well. Or you can also email us at, NIH at nihp2p at mail.nih.gov. And if you, uh, to view the closed captions for this workshop, you can view it in the multimedia viewer at the bottom right corner of your WebEx uh, window as well. So if it's not showing up, you can click on the three dots there and that should be able to open it up and you can select multimedia. Opportunities to, um, we're gonna share opportunities to comment on, review and comment on the draft systematic evidence review prepared by the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center and I have the link here, and we'll also post that uh, on, in the chat pod whenever at the end of the each day. And you, we're gonna also provide you with a, an opportunity to review and comment on the panel's draft report, and the report will summarize the workshop and provide recommendations for future research priorities. And that won't be available uh, until spring of 2021 on the ODP website, and we'll be sure if you are registered, we'll send you a notification of that. And at the end of our, uh, at the conclusion of the three-day workshop, all registered attendees will have an opportunity to uh, provide us feedback on the workshop. You'll receive an email from nihp2p logistics at westat.com with the survey link. It should only take about five to 10 minutes to complete and it helps us improve our workshop program. So we look forward to receiving your feedback. And at the end of the day, I'll remind everyone that if you are not already registered and would like to join us for day two, uh, I'll provide some additional details in terms of what we're gonna be covering for that day and also the link for registering. 
So with that, let us begin the workshop. I would like to invite Dr. David Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Direct, and the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention, to kick off our workshop with a welcome and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Diana Bianchi. Uh, thank you, Keisha. Uh, good morning. I am David Murray, uh, Associate Director of Prevention, Director of the NIH Office of Disease Prevention. We're delighted to partner with the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke to host this workshop. We have three days of exciting presentations and discussion sessions with expert speakers lined up for you. I would like to introduce Dr. Diana Bianchi, who will open the workshop for us. Dr. Bianchi is the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. In that role, she oversees an annual budget of approximately $1.5 billion in support for NICHD's mission to lead research and training to understand human development, improve reproductive health, enhance the lives of children and adolescents, and optimize abilities for all. NICHD is also home to the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research, which originally proposed this workshop. Dr. Bianchi received her MD from Stanford University School of Medicine and her postgraduate training in pediatrics, medical genetics, and neonatal perinatal medicine at Boston's Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bianchi's research focuses on prenatal genomics with the goal of advancing non-invasive prenatal DNA screening and diagnosis to develop new therapies for genetic disorders that can be administered prenatally. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Diana Bianchi. Thank you so much, David. And I'd like to add my good morning to everyone and welcome you to the Pathways to Prevention Workshop, Can Physical Activity Improve the Health of Wheelchair Users? As you heard, I'm Dr. Diana Bianchi, and I'm the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, which we're going to refer to as NICHD, henceforth. NICHD is also the home, as you heard, to the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research, which we'll refer to as NCMRR. So our institute has a longstanding vested in interest in supporting research to help individuals with disabilities, including those who use a range of wheeled mobility devices. This is an important year because it marks both the 30th anniversary of the NCMRR and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So this workshop is especially timely. As we move towards the future, we recognize that it's vital to include input from people of all ability levels to meet the needs of everyone. I'd also like to thank the people who helped to organize and support this workshop, including the Workshop Planning Committee, our NIH partners in the Office of Disease Prevention, and the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke, our federal partners in the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs, along with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality within the Department of Health and Human Services, the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center at Oregon Health Services, at Oregon Health Sciences University, who are up very early this morning, um, the workshop speakers, and the independent panel. This has been an extraordinary effort to bring together many moving parts, particularly during a pandemic, and we truly appreciate the contributions that each of you has made to what I'm sure will be a successful three-day workshop. I'd also like to thank you all for adapting to the format changes necessitated by the current global pandemic. As you heard from Keisha, this workshop was originally scheduled for late March, uh, so it was one of the first that had to be rescheduled and hosted virtually. By now, we're all veterans at this, however. So I know we all hope to hold this workshop in person, but I'm confident that the end product will be fantastic, and it'll allow many people to access the workshop who could not otherwise travel to Maryland, even without an ongoing pandemic. Although millions of Americans use wheeled mobility devices, wheelchair use and its impact on overall health is vastly understudied. Physical activity is likely to have wide-ranging impacts on the health of people who use wheeled mobility devices. And this workshop aims to assess the evidence base for physical activity 
as an intervention to prevent diseases such as obesity and diabetes. The sessions will also investigate potential benefits and harms of physical activity interventions, along with any evidence gaps that could point to future research opportunities. NICHD's relatively new strategic plan was introduced uh, just over a year ago, and this Pathways to Prevention workshop fits within several aspects of that strategic plan. The plan itself is structured around five different scientific research themes, and in particular, theme five is advancing safe and effective therapeutics and, and devices for pregnant and lactating women, children, and people with disabilities. Our institute is focused on advancing the health of these populations that are often overlooked in research studies. Our strategic plan also emphasizes cross-cutting themes for disease prevention and health disparities, both of which are extremely relevant to the discussions that will occur over the next few days. David gave you our mission statement, but I'll give you our vision statement, which is healthy pregnancies, healthy children, healthy and optimal lives. Physical activity is integral to achieving healthy and optimal lives, and I hope that the discussions over the next few days will inform all of us how best to integrate physical activity for those who use wheeled mobility devices. Thank you for giving me the chance to participate in this workshop, and um, we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Bianchi. Bianchi. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bianchi. We'll keep, for those opening remarks, we'll keep you in mind uh, what you share with us as we navigate through these three-day uh, workshops. We will now have a charge to the panel from Dr. David Murray. Uh, thank you. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our office and how we uh, got involved with the Pathways to Prevention uh, workshop series. And then I want to give a charge to the panel. So we are the Office of Disease Prevention. Um, our mission is, is listed here. We're basically uh, charged with improving um, public health by increasing the scope, quality, dissemination, and impact of prevention research supported by the whole agency. Uh, we work with the institutes and centers. We're a small office and really uh, only accomplish things by collaborating with our partners, uh, our friends here at NIH. Next slide, please. Uh, we also work from a strategic plan. You just heard a little bit about the NICHD strategic plan. We're in the midst of our uh, second uh, plan. Uh, and uh, virtually everything that we do in the office is built around the plan or based on what's in the plan. Next slide, please. We have six strategic priorities. They range from conducting portfolio analysis uh, to advancing tobacco regulatory science, to communicating efforts and findings. So these six uh, uh, priorities are, and uh, the three cross-cutting themes really guide everything that we do. Next slide. Um, the uh, Pathways to Prevention workshop that we're holding today and tomorrow and uh, on Thursday um, uh, comes out of priority two. Uh, priority two is all about identifying evidence gaps, um, uh, areas that need additional research. Uh, and our goal in the Pathways to Prevention program is to assess the available scientific evidence uh, by doing a systematic evidence review um, uh, in order to, re uh, to identify research gaps and future needs to better understand the potential benefits, uh, in this case, of physical activity interventions for people at risk of using or currently using wheeled mobility devices. Next slide. Uh, there are uh, a number of main components of a P2P workshop. Uh, the first one is an independent panel, uh, shown here at the bottom of the slide. And I'll say a little bit more about the criteria that we use to select the members of the panel. I'll also introduce the panel as I give them their charge. Next slide. Uh, we do a portfolio analysis uh, of uh, relevant research supported by NIH and provide the results of that analysis to the panel. Next slide. Uh, the uh, uh, Evidence-Based Practice Center, supported by ARC, uh, prepares an evidence report. Uh, this is uh, one of the lengthy parts of the planning process. This can take a year and a half to do, 
And in the case of this particular workshop, they got an extra six months uh, because uh, we had to postpone from March until uh, November. Uh, so they, they, they have a longer uh, set of evidence, a larger set of evidence to cover. Next slide. We have presentations from experts um, uh, in this content area who will be making presentations uh, to the panel uh, today and tomorrow. Next slide. We have participation from the audience, and we hope that you will participate. Uh, Keisha told you uh, about using the Q&A pod in order to submit questions or offer comments, so we encourage you to do that. Next slide. Uh, the independent panel will take all of this information into account uh, and prepare a draft report, which will be posted on the ODP website uh, for public comment. Uh, and uh, after digesting uh, all of the comments, they will prepare a final report, which, which will be published in the peer-reviewed literature. Next slide. Um, we uh, uh, have been conducting the P2P program since I came to NIH in uh, 2012. Um, we have uh, had a number of them uh, over the years. Uh, we tend to have uh, one a year, and we've listed several of them here. Um, uh, we uh, do publish the findings and recommendations from each of these workshops in the peer-reviewed literature, and these reports get a lot of attention. Every one has been in the top 5% of the published literature, and uh, the one on opioids and chronic pain uh, at the bottom of this list is actually in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the published literature in terms of relative influence. Next slide, please. The key workshop uh, participants are listed here. In addition to our office, we have uh, very important institute coordinators. I'll identify them a little bit later. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, area experts, content area experts from across NIH who uh, contribute, especially early on, uh, to thinking about what should the uh, workshop try to cover, what are the key questions. The uh, uh, ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center um, uh, plays a key role, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, I've mentioned the panel, we have speakers, we have participants, you, and we have federal partners who will work with us to implement um, activities following the recommendations uh, from the workshop. Next slide. The Evidence-Based Practice Center uh, performs a systematic review of the evidence um, to uh, prepare a report, which has been transmitted already to the panel. Uh, they've had a chance to study it and uh, prepare um, uh, working from it. Um, ODP pays for that uh, evidence review through an interagency agreement with AHRQ. Next slide. The Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center at Oregon Health and Science University prepared the evidence review for this particular workshop, and we're going to hear from Shelley Self and Marion McDonough on the findings of the review for each of four key questions that they considered. Next slide. The independent panel is chosen based on these criteria. No financial or intellectual conflicts of interest is the first one. I don't want to uh, emphasize that because one of the questions that we often get is, why don't you have experts on the content area that the workshop is addressing? We pick our panel members because they aren't experts in that content area. Uh, they don't have intellectual conflicts of interest. They can be neutral parties in evaluating the evidence. Uh, so that's an important consideration. Uh, we have non-federal representation. We do pick experts in a variety of fields, uh, um, uh, scientific methods, clinical practice, academic research, public health, but not the specific content uh, that's the focus of the workshop. Uh, the panel will produce a report that synthesizes the findings and details recommendations for future activities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the charge to the panel. Uh, uh, we would implore the panel members to listen to everything that goes on over the next three days, to attend all of the uh, panel executive writing sessions and prepare a draft panel report. Um, we want them to review and incorporate public comments and finalize the uh, panel report that gets uh, published on the ODP website, uh, well, the preliminary report um, uh, for a four-week comment period. Next slide, please. Uh, the panel members, uh, Dr. Jerry Gertwitz, uh, Myers Primary Care Institute, UMass Medical School. Uh, he is our uh, workshop chair. Uh, Noel Carlozzi uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, Kirsten Davison from uh, Boston College School of Social Work. Kelly Evanson from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
Daryl Gaskin from Johns Hopkins, and Boris Lushniak from the University of Maryland. Next slide. Uh, the speakers uh, and panelists and presenters will all um, disclose any conflicts of interest over the course of the workshop. Next slide. Um, we have um, uh, a few features of the workshop listed here. I've already spoken about uh, a number of these, uh, um, so I will move on. Next slide. Uh, I want to thank uh, especially the Institute coordinators, Allison Chernich from NICHD, uh, Joe Bonner, Teresa Cruz also from NICHD, uh, Daphne Chen from NINDS, and Lynn Jakeman from NINDS. Um, I want to uh, thank the uh, group at AHRQ and the Pacific Northwest uh, Evidence-Based Practice Center. Certainly, I want to thank uh, the members of my staff who've worked so hard on this, uh, the members of the WestStat uh, uh, staff who are providing logistics support, and I want to thank all the workshop speakers and panel members. Next slide. Uh, so I will turn things back. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I need to uh, introduce uh, the chair of the uh, uh, panel um, so that. So I'll take over, David. <laughs> and, and keeping with our agenda, uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Jerry Gerwitz, our workshop and panel chair, who will give an overview of the panel activities. After the overview, we will hear from the uh, introductory session speakers. And so we can go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Gerwitz. Sure, thank you, Keisha. And uh, thank you, Dr. Murray, for that uh, overview and that kind introduction. Um, I am honored to serve as a member of the independent panel and as its chair. Next slide. And I do not have any disclosures to report. Next slide. And I am really privileged to serve with a group of um, esteemed panelists, and I look forward to continuing to work with them. Just want to say all of these people have put in a great deal of time in preparing for the workshop, and uh, we're looking forward to it very much. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit or mention and reiterate and reinforce some of the things that Dr. Murray said about panel activities and responsibilities. Our responsibility has been to read the Evidence-Based Practice Center Systematic Evidence Review and hear from them. Our responsibility will be to consider evidence from the speakers and comments from the audience. We will be drafting a panel report which will briefly summarize the scientific literature, briefly address evidence from the speakers, and importantly, outline recommendations and, uh, and underscore gaps for future research. We will highlight what needs to be prioritized to move the field forward. So we will be listening intently to all the presenters particularly in regard to the last two bullets I mentioned, uh, gaps in the research that's currently available and what needs to be prioritized. We will draft a report, which will be open for public comment on the ODP website for 30 days. And our final report, as Dr. Murray stated, will be published in a peer-reviewed journal. Next slide. So the structure of the workshop, the EPC systematic review will cover published evidence on the health effects of physical activity in people with cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury. The workshop speakers will present current science and perspectives on the impact of physical activity interventions for people at risk of using or currently using wheeled mobility devices. Each session will address one of the workshop key questions. 
The first talk of each session will summarize the EPC review. Subsequent talks will address research gaps or provide other information. Uh, I just want to emphasize each speaker will introduce themselves, their name, their title, their affiliation, and their presentation title, so keep that in mind. And each session, except for this first session, will end with a 40-minute town hall discussion with all speakers from that session. This session will end, with, I think, with 20 minutes for discussion, up to 20 minutes. Uh, ground rules, the panel, the panelists will be allowed to ask questions first. And with regard to that, I will be asking each of the panelists if they have any questions. So uh, no need to worry, each of the panelists will be identified and asked if they have questions at the presentation. There is no time limit for panelist questions. Audience questions and comments will be considered after panel questions have been addressed. But keep in mind that even if we don't address those questions, the panel will have access to them and will review them. Uh, there will be a 10-minute break between sessions. And importantly, sessions will start and end on time. It's definitely been reinforced with me to do that. Next slide. So your comments are encouraged, and I think you've already heard from Keisha uh, to use uh, the Q&A pod and how to get to that. Uh, that use the chat pod for technical issues. You can use Twitter, or you can email nihp2p at mail.nih. So thank you, and I look forward to the workshop very much, uh, again, with my colleagues who are the panelists today. Thank you, Dr. Gerwitz. Now that uh, we've highlighted our panel activities, we will start our first presentation by Dr. Allison Cernich on the topic, including everyone, physical activity as preventive medicine. Welcome, Dr. Furnish. Thank you, Keisha. I'm having a little trouble. I originally had my video up, but for whatever reason, it seems to be frozen. So I will continue to work on that, but I do not want to delay us. So I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity. Um, if you could uh, advance my slide. Oh, so awesome. Oh, God. Keisha, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Because WebEx just totally crashed on me, uh, which is super. Um, so what I am going to do is try and figure out an alternative. Um, hold on one second. I. It's been up and working just fine, and now it is not. So hold on one second, please. Uh, Allison, do you do you have a copy of your slides? We can advance them for you, and we still hear you on the uh, WebEx. Where I'm trying to go, Keisha, I my computer actually has totally stopped. So I am just, we're going to do uh, a little bit of a workaround here. Um, Hi, Allison. This is Joe. I just emailed them to you. Thank you, Joe, because nothing is working, and that is awesome. Um, thank you. Hold one second to see if it's coming through, which, of course, it's All right. All right. Hopefully it's going to stay connected. Okay. Here. Sometimes we have these yeah. technical challenges. Not a problem. Of course, right out the gate, right? Um, let me get 
There we go. Hopefully it came through and we'll just go from there. It has not been a good technical day for me. Okay. Thank you all for your patience and apologize. So um, I'll go to the next slide. So we'll go to physical activity. And I think to frame this, um, I had the opportunity to help with the last draft of the physical activity guidelines um, from my position and uh, when I was the director of NCMRR and to give input with respect to the sections on um, individuals with disability, but generally what we know is that physical activity is really critical to benefit health with improvements noted in specific types of diseases that are preventable, with uh, sleep, which is key to health maintenance, with quality of life, with physical function, and with cognitive function, even for those individuals that do not have a functional limitation. We also know that sedentary behavior negatively impacts health in terms of all causes of mortality, increased cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes, and also increased risk for certain cancers. Next slide, please. So when the physical activity guideline second edition came out, what we noted was that, you know, at that point, 3.6 million Americans use a wheeled mobility device, uh, which is a substantial portion of the population, but also that for the recommendations for individuals with disability, the emphasis was on slowing disease progression or impact, um, rather than necessarily looking at um, what types of exercises or how long and what, what intensity would be needed to maintain health. And specifically, though pictured in the guidelines, there's no real recommendation in terms of assistive devices the ways to implement these in populations that may face challenges because of environmental barriers or other types of challenges to engage in physical activity. So next slide. So the key guidelines for adults with chronic health conditions and adults with disabilities are really based on a variety of conditions with an overall recommendation. And it stresses that physical activity provides important health benefits for people with disability. But the other critical piece of this is it does not focus specifically on those individuals who may have limitations, physical limitations, because they use assistive devices. So if you go to the next slide, we have a number of ongoing research activities at NIH, next slide, where we've looked at you know, for the rehabilitation research portfolio that is officially categorized, and this is 2018 data. Uh, we'll be presenting the 2019 data next week at the National Advisory Board for Medical Rehabilitation Research. But NIH has a fairly significant um, investment in funding for rehabilitation, and as part of this, it often includes people with disabilities. Now, we can't necessarily and have not necessarily broken this out for wheelchair users specifically, but we do have about, um, about $83 million in physical activity in the rehabilitation research category. And if we go to the next slide, we can look at um, a, an analysis that was done by our colleagues in ODP. Um, they made fantastic use of the six months of um, downtime and did a great analysis of what's existing in this research um, arena based on um, a look at federal reporter. Um, the data are not yet final, but we thought we'd share that across the federal government, we have about 36 projects at NIH that focus on um, physical activity and wheelchair users. And then we also looked at um, DOD's congressionally directed medical research programs, Nidler's research programs, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and also PCORI, which receives federal funding but is not a federal agency necessarily. Their money comes through the trust fund. Um, for Medicare, um, for patient-centered outcomes research. But that said, um, through the Affordable Care Act, so that said, there's about 54 projects across the agencies. If we move, move to the next slide and we look at NIH, NICHD has, has been the lead in this particular area of research, but our colleagues across the NIH, and this is true for most of the rehabilitation research portfolio, are also active in trying to stimulate this research. 
So I think the, the bottom line is for new funding um, each year, we are definitely trying to enhance um, this particular area of research. Next slide. The other here, and again, this is from the ODP analysis, um, they are looking at the mechanisms here. So it's primarily an individual research project, um, but we also have some research in the intramural portion of NIH. Um, we are funding research centers, and then we are funding training grants and industry-related grants, small business um, grants. Um, and this rounds out the portfolio of grants in the current research in this area. So let's go to the next slide. So why did we look at physical activity and the health of wheelchair users? So next slide for purpose and focus. Individuals who use wheel mobility devices face specific risks. Um, so obviously, if you are using a manual wheelchair, um, there are potentially physical effects to you of chronic wheelchair use, and NIH actually does fund some research on those particular injuries, and the prevention of those injuries are different ways that wheelchairs can be made to reduce those injuries and strain on shoulder or elbow. There's also consequences of limited physical activity. Not that every wheelchair user is sedentary, and obviously some of our um, wheelchair athletes, those who participate in, in races and marathons and Paralympics and wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, obviously those folks are very physically active, but for those individuals who are not active at, their le at that level, um, their level of activity may be less than what's uh, even suggested by the guidelines, and there are the consequences of that limited physical activity on overall health. And then as many of you may know, wheelchair users face a specific environmental barrier. Many of our places where we think we could recreate or engage in fitness-related activities are not accessible to everyone. Uh, and this has come up over and over again in that the environmental barriers that people face may also inhibit their likelihood of engaging in physical activity. So considering those in terms of how we get people to engage in an activity we know is good for their preventive health um, needs to be addressed by the research. And we have some great speakers in this workshop who will talk a bit about that. And then wheelchair use itself poses potential impacts in terms of not only the overuse injuries that I mentioned, but also potentially skin breakdown because of a continued seated position, potential carpal tunnel syndrome, and also, in this population, there's an increased risk for obesity and cardiovascular conditions. So next slide. So when we originally proposed this project to ODP, and, and shockingly enough, this has been almost three to four years ago when I was approached by ODP to think about what could we do for individuals with disability to advance their health and think about a preventive area that may have impact. And we really thought through this, and I will credit uh, Joe Bonner as well as my colleagues at the NINDF, Lynn Jakeman and Dao Sen Chen, to really helping to shape the scope of this project. And I'll explain a little bit about why we did what we did. But through this, we'll be addressing four key questions. Obviously, I'm not going to read all of them. The first key question really does center around the evidence base for the intervention that will help with preventive health and what harms they may pose. The second really looks at what are the benefits and harms um, for the physical activity intervention for people who are at risk for or currently use a wheel mobility device. The third quick question is really about patient factors. So what are the things about the individual who uses the wheel mobility device that would impact the benefits and harms of physical activity. So what if they have other comorbid conditions? Um, or what if they have specific risks for other types of injury? And key question four, what are the methodologic weaknesses or gaps that exist in the evidence to determine the benefits and harms of physical activity? And I will say that this one really does cry out for more um, attention from my perspective in looking at this and scoping. One of the things that Joe and I looked at when we originally scoped this in NCMRR was one of the key sort of surprises to me was how seldom 
people actually document what assistive technologies are used by individuals in engaging in adaptive physical activity. So do they use their wheelchair all the time? Do they use their wheelchair only seldom and they can have limited ambulation? Um, are they using um, dual canes or a rollator or a walker? And those limitations then limit the ways that we implement these types of activities in a systematic way to provide evidence and systematic reviews to inform guidelines. And I think these are the key things that we thought they're semi-simple, but if they're not documented, it really does limit our ability to look at the evidence. Obviously, the other piece of this is that we had to narrow in terms of population. Because if we looked across the literature when we did this for all individuals who are at risk for wheelchair use, and I note the previous methodologic limitation, then we had to pick conditions. So our rationale in picking the conditions was to look at different etiologies, conditions that would present at different levels of age and would cause different levels of disability but which all potentially placed people at risk for wheelchair use. We narrowed down the focus to cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury, and multiple sclerosis. And I will note that we considered other conditions such as stroke. And the issue there is that the breadth of the literature was often a little bit more and the types of activities were a little bit more than were, um, we were capable of dealing with in this particular review. The next slide, kind of reflects what we learned in that when we scoped this review, what we learned is the focus of current research is not necessarily on the preventive aspect of exercise. It is really on disease progression and symptom control. So for example, does exercise impact the ability to walk for a young person with cerebral palsy? While that's useful, it doesn't tell us about the potential preventive health benefits. Again, there's little to no information on the use of mobility devices in terms of the type, frequency, or level of assist. Many of the studies are limited to short -term outcomes, and there is very few in the literature that look at standard biomarkers that are used in physical activity research in other areas. For example, no measures of VO2 max, no measures of heart rate or heart rate variability. So there is no way to compare the effectiveness, even if the intensity is lower, in terms of the preventive health outcome. The other is that standard preventive outcomes in populations without disability are not routinely measured in the disability community. So for example, did we decrease the risk of heart disease? Did we decrease the conversion um, from um, either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes back to pre-diabetes or non-diabetic. These preventive outcomes will help us to justify the need for support for physical activity in people with disabilities. Without that evidence, we really do have a difficult time making those types of recommendations and large-scale guidelines, such as the physical activity guidelines for Americans. The other is that there is a lack of common or core elements to allow for meta-analysis in some areas. And that's both related to disease as well as to the types of activity and or the conditions studied. So next slide, what is our goal? Well, our goal when we started out was really to find a way to implement a systematic review that would inform the next version of the physical activity guidelines for all Americans. To identify opportunities for research to inform a physical activity research agenda, that is really about health and wellness rather than focusing on conditions or disease. We also want to understand the benefits and harms of physical factors and denote the specific person factors that may impact the benefit-harm determination. So really better understanding how do we classify some of these individual factors in ways that we can aggregate them for a systematic review. And finally, and obviously our most important goal, we want to be able to improve the overall health of individuals who use wheeled mobility devices. We've heard this over and over again from the communities with whom we work in that, you know, people with spinal cord injury will tell us our 
we are dying of heart disease, right? And it's because there are limitations, there are individual harms and risks. And if we can't address that, we can't improve overall health, we can't improve all-cause mortality, and we can't ultimately improve the quality of life of individuals who use wheel mobility devices across their lifespan. Next slide. So I just want to conclude, um, and again, apologies for the technical limitations that I had. Um, I really thought I had this one set up. But I think this picture actually <laughs> from my neighborhood summarizes this perfectly. This has been quite a year, uh, and it's not over yet. Um, but I feel like, you know, it's only uh, Tuesday, and I feel like it's been a year already. Um, so this is just a picture that I've taken um, during my walk. But I will say the other real joy in this year and over the past few years in working with not only the NIH Office of Disease Prevention, who deserves so much credit for moving this forward, and that team has been spectacular, but also our NIH co-lead from NINDS, specifically Lynn Jakeman and Dao Fen Chen, our colleagues on the NIH Medical Rehabilitation Coordinating Committee, and NICHD staff who have been incredibly supportive, and then our federal partners who helped us to scope this review initially, including AHRQ, especially David, CDC, the Department of Defense, NIDLR, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Veterans Affairs. We cannot thank you enough for all that you've done to support us. Specifically, our systematic review partners at uh, Oregon Health Sciences University have been stellar in working with us in modifying the questions and doing a thorough and just specific systematic review and their ability to really integrate this research and identify places where we needed to modify was just critical. I cannot say enough. And I also want to thank the panel. I know you are going out of your way in what is a critical time for public health, and I appreciate it so much, and our speakers who have been involved in shaping this agenda <clears throat> and bringing forth topics that are really critical. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Joe Bonner, who started on this project as a AAAS fellow um, and who is now a member of our NICT family and part of the NCMRR team. He really has been the champion of this, and I cannot say enough what dedication, what a keen eye, and what work he has put into this. It would not have happened without him, and I cannot say thank you enough. And then finally, I want to thank all of you for tuning in. This really is something that I think we can advance as a community to improve the health and lives of individuals with disability and to make their overall health a key outcome um, in including them in the way that we prevent disease going forward. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Keisha, and thank you again for leadership, coordination, and tolerance of Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cernich. Wow. Thank you for sharing that insightful background, purpose, and scope of this workshop and for highlighting NIH's research investment for this research topic. We will now shift our focus over to our keynote presentation titled Physical Activity and Wheelchair Users, What Are We Going to Do About the State of the Science? This is being given by uh, Dr. Carrie Morgan. Welcome, Dr. Morgan. Dr. Morgan, we're going to have to have you use that display settings menu and then do switch slide, switch uh, screens. There we go. And I'm going to unmute you. All right, you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? We see your thank you slide. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you see my thank you slide. All right, hang on. Wait, back up to the beginning. Oh, she needs to so share. Actually, she needs to share. That, that works. Nice. Thank you. That works. It's working. Yep, it looks good. We're good? Yep. All right, good. Hello, everyone. I'm Carrie Morgan. I'm an assistant professor of occupational therapy and neurology 
at Washington University, and I'm speaking to you today from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm extremely passionate about this topic and excited to participate in this workshop. In the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to set the stage for the panelists by identifying issues that will hopefully lead to further discussion of where we as a community wish to go with our research and what we want it to look like when we are successful. Let's see. I have no information to disclose. Let's see, I'm having some issues with, okay. In preparation for this presentation, I emailed with several experts in this area that are presenting at this workshop and asked what they thought the gaps were in our current research. There were four clear themes identified. Theme one, we still need conclusive research identifying minimal dosage to inform our physical activity guidelines for wheelchair users. Theme two, we have an issue that the greater body of physical activity research often excludes persons that use a wheelchair. Theme three, physical activity research as it is currently does not always accommodate the variability in the population of wheelchair users. And theme four, that the spectrum of research currently is somewhat limited with much of the research not reaching the implementation stage and often not sustainable. Throughout my talk, you will see some of the challenges these gaps present in making physical activity a reality for persons using wheelchairs. Okay, so I wanted to start off talking a little bit about what we do know, and this really aligns with some of the things that Allison discussed. We know that the wheelchair user population is at a greater risk for chronic diseases and has a higher likelihood of being obese than people without disabilities. These implications come with high healthcare costs. We also know that many barriers exist for people that use wheelchairs to participate in physical activity. Wheelchair users remain one of the least physically active populations in the United States. I truly believe that this is not that people don't want to participate in physical activity, and a good example of this is data from a cohort study, and I'm co-investigator on, of people with mobility disabilities ages 45 to 65. And overall, 66% of this cohort reported that they wanted to do more physical activity than they were currently doing. This included people that were not doing any physical activity at all, that wanted to start doing some level of physical activity, as well as those that were doing some level of physical activity but felt like they could be doing more to reach their health benefits. The other thing that we know is that regular physical activity is widely recognized as having health benefits. This is true for the wheelchair user population as well. And with very clear studies showing impacts on areas such as cardiovascular health, strength, endurance, depression, as well as increasing everyday participation, independence, and quality of life. The question is, how do we move our research towards supporting wheelchair users in experiencing these benefits? I've experienced the barriers and facilitators to accessing and participating in physical activity from three different perspectives. As a person with a disability, a practicing occupational therapist, and a rehabilitation researcher. I'm gonna share each of these perspectives with you. In talking about my speech with others, I was guided that the most interesting part was my personal journey. I'm gonna take this as a sign that my personal journey is interesting and not that my research is boring. Therefore, I'm gonna spend most of my time talking to you today about my journey. Like any good researcher, I'll frame it as a research design, a case study of N equals one, me. So for a little disclaimer here, this is a self-report study. It's retrospective and has questionable rigor. I'm going to use the title of the workshop as my research question. Can physical activity improve the health of wheelchair users? 
So let's get to know our case study a little bit better. I've had a disability since the age of one when I contracted transverse myelitis, which presents like an incomplete spinal cord injury. I get some function back below the level of inflammation, but not all, and I grew up using all kinds of different assistive technology devices. Currently, I use a manual wheelchair for everyday mobility. I grew up in a very supportive and active family that loved sports and was very competitive. I had an older brother who wanted me to be involved in neighborhood sports, so he, had, he would adapt the activities for me. A prime example is in the fall time, the neighborhood kids would want to get together and play football. My brother was pretty smart, and he knew that I wasn't going to be very good at a running back, so he wanted me to be successful, and he had me practice over and over and over again to throw the perfect spiral football so that I could be the quarterback. He would make up the rules, he'd prop me up in a lawn chair, and he would give the other team 10 seconds to pummel me out of the lawn chair. These experiences, I think, not only made me tough, but also allowed me to participate with the neighborhood kids. I grew up before much of the equipment, programs, and resources that are available now. My parents got me involved in all kinds of different activities, from being the mascot of my brother's baseball team, which was great to be part of the team, but I didn't actually get to participate in the actual activity, to swimming. To this day, I'm a very good swimmer. I actually swam on the high school swim team, but I swam against people that didn't have disabilities and they were starting on the starting block, diving into the pool, and I was starting in the water. I came in last place every time. Where these were good experiences for social interaction and physical activity, I could not find my competitive outlet growing up. And really conventional physical activity really felt quite unattainable to me. It wasn't until my mid-20s when I found wheelchair sports. It was really a peer or a friend that told me about it um, and pretty much just kept nagging me that I needed to come out and try this crazy sport called wheelchair rugby. I think the experiences in the backyard with my brother prepared me for this wheelchair contact sport. This sport opened up a whole new world to me. I started playing very recreationally, but it grew into much more. This was the first time that I saw that people with disabilities could not only be part of a team, be physically active, but had a true opportunity to be elite athletes. I decided I wanted to do that. I wanted to be a part of that. And I, I worked hard. I found the support that I needed to be the best athlete I could. And I ended up becoming the first woman ever to make a U.S. national wheelchair rugby team. It ended up that my rugby career was quite short. I was a little too small um, to play wheelchair rugby on the international level, but I wasn't fulfilled and I needed to find another competitive outlet. It's funny in life, sometimes when one door opens and another door, one door closes, another one opens where you don't expect it. When I was training for rugby in the off season, I was told that if I wanted to get faster and work on my hand speed, I really needed to do wheelchair racing. When wheelchair rugby did not work out for a long-term competitive option, I turned to wheelchair racing. I've competed as a T52 female in the Paralympics, meaning that I competed against other women with limited trunk and hand function, and I've excelled. I've competed in three Paralympic Games and four World Championships. Racing has really brought a lot to me. I've traveled the world. I've competed in front of 94,000 people. I've represented the U.S. and won medals, and I've met amazing people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. If you would have told me as a kid with a disability that this was possible, I would have not been able to imagine it. So I want to share one of my races with you. Um, this is hard to believe that this was just one year ago when you could actually get on an airplane and travel to different countries. This is my last race that I competed in. Um, let's see, and it might be playing slow here. Is a video playing for you guys? No. How about now? 
Okay, awesome. Yep. It's going to come through a little choppy, but it's coming. Okay, great. So this is my last race. It's a T52 finals, 100-meter race at World Championships in Dubai. I'm in lane six in the blue helmet. And I'm showing this race, well, because it had a great result, but also because I think this race really defines my physical activity journey. It was, I had a very slow start, but once I got momentum, I had a really strong finish. And it looks like it might have froze again for you guys. Let's try it one more time. The ending is the best part, so make sure everybody sees that. All right, so let's visit, revisit our case study here and our original research question, which was, can physical activity improve the health of wheelchair users? So I've lived with a disability for over 40 years. I currently take no medications. According to my doctor and my last physical, I'm healthy, I'm independent, and I'm employed, and I'm meeting my goals the way that I would like to. So I would conclude that the answer to the question for this case study of N is yes. I think everyone at this workshop is here because we all believe the answer to this question is yes. But potentially we need better evidence and I think the next question in answering this is not can it, but also how. How do we better support persons using a wheelchair to successfully engage in levels, levels of physical activity that are truly going to impact health? And as any good researcher, we're always looking for key active ingredients for interventions to drive health behavior change. Let's take a closer look at a couple of the examples of key ingredients that put me on a path of success. I think a big one is motivation. This often presents itself in having goals that you want to accomplish. Motivation is difficult when you don't see a clear path to meet your goals. For me, my goals evolved and I needed the support to be different for each goal. My original goal started out as wanting to be included and socially connected with my peers. As I got older, my physical activity goals evolved to just wanting to be healthy and then evolved even further seeing that I could possibly compete at an elite athlete level. As I age more and more, my shoulders are starting to get a bit creaky, and people ask me what I'm training for right now. And honestly, it's for life. It's to maintain my mobility. It's to be able to keep doing the activities I want to do as I continue to age. I think another really big key support or key ingredient that happened that helped me to be successful was support. And there's, there's two pieces of support that I'm going to highlight. One, um, the first one I like to highlight is equipment. Um, the part of the story that I didn't share with you is that six years prior to starting wheelchair racing, I got in a race chair for the very first time, and it was the worst experience that I've had. I did, it was so bad that I actually didn't get in another race chair for another six years. The race chair was too big. It was painful. I had no understanding how to use it or why I was positioned that way. And equipment truly matters. Su successful experiences require appropriate adaptations and equipment from informed guidance. The other thing that was important in my success was how I trained. And I had a really difficult road finding people that helped guide me here. I could find people that knew a lot about disability, or I could find people that knew a lot about training and physical activity, but I couldn't find both. And when I found a coach that had a disability background, who was an elite athlete and trained elite athletes, it really allowed me to start competing at a higher level and to do it safely. So I think you can tell by um, uh, my short story here is that it's been a lifelong journey for me to reach my physical activity goals, and it really should not be that hard for people that use wheelchairs. My path was not linear, um, and I think the game changer for me was really finding my race chair. Well, when I actually found one that fits me, 
um, you know, finding the right shirt clicked with me. It provided freedom, it provided independence, and it pro provided an avenue for me to reach my goals the way that I wanted to do it. And my goal in life as a professional and a researcher is to make the path easier and help people find their race chair or that thing that will motivate or promote passion for someone to want to be engaged and maintain it. Not everybody's going to want to be a race or a Paralympic athlete. It's going to look different for everyone. But finding what clicks for people, what fits, I think is really crucial to getting people to initiate, build a foundation, and maintain physical activity. Let's talk a little bit about my experience as an occupational therapist. I had an opportunity to work, to work with a lot of people with disabilities. And really what I learned here is that people with disabilities that use wheelchairs, they want to be physically active. They often don't know what's possible. They often don't know where to go for support. And often the barriers are just so overwhelming, they don't know where to turn. As a healthcare professional, I played a key role in recommending physical activity for wheelchair users, but I often face many challenges. The evidence is often not available or confusing, and I didn't want to put people more at risk. There's limited availability and accessibility of options, so after I was finished working with someone, I wasn't always sure what the best handoff was or where to refer people to continue meeting their physical activity goals. And in the healthcare system, the medical model for reimbursements really set up with the goal of keeping people safe in their home and mobile in their home. And therefore, things like promoting physical activity as a healthcare need doesn't always get the focus that it needs. And just as it seemed for me, conventional physical activity often seemed unattainable for the people with people that using wheelchairs that I work with. And I think as a community, we need to continue to think about fixing the system and not necessarily the person. And I believe one way to do that is to continue to promote systematic change by creating the needed evidence to show the importance of physical activity to support function and prevent chronic health conditions. And this really is what motivated me to want to become a researcher. And I may be a bit biased here, but I think in order to create the change we want, it's going to come from the research. My research is focused on the community aspect. People with disabilities live in the community, they participate in the community, and their research needs to translate into the community. I value working with stakeholders, including people with disabilities and community organizations. And just a quick example of my research, I'm currently working with persons with spinal cord injury that are not engaging in physical activity, but they want to. And they've really identified some clear goals that they want to achieve from doing physical activity. And I've sort of highlighted those two themes through the ICF in two different colors on the slide. The goals highlighted in blue really relate to physical activity goals that align with probably traditional exercise goals, which are wanting to maintain cardiovascular fitness, want to improve endurance, decrease fatigue, increase strength. And then the yellow goals really highlight that people with spinal cord injury that use wheelchairs also want to use physical activity to help them meet goals in everyday life, to improve their mobility in their everyday life and their independence and self-care activities. I think as researchers, we need to make sure our interventions and programs meet the goals of wheelchair users. So when I look forward to 20 or 30 years from now, what do I envision? And as a person with a disability, what I would love to say is that I could roll into REI or a sporting goods store and go to the adapted section or the wheelchair section and find the specialized equipment I need without trying to specially order it online through one separate company. As a person with a disability, I would love in 20 or 30 years that I could put on my own smart technology that knows the level of intensity that I need to personally achieve to meet my health goals and informs me if I'm achieving it. 
in 20 or 30 years or even sooner, I would love if healthcare professionals that I see are not hesitant to recommend physical activity because they think that it's going to do more harm. In 20 or 30 years, I would love to see accessible and available resources to do the physical activity that I want to do whenever I want to do it and however I want. In order for this to happen, we, we need research that is collaborative and translational and that spans the medical model into the community. We need systems in place to identify goals and personal factors that predict the best fit of physical activity for wheelchair users. We need trained professionals in disability and physical activity to implement interventions and programs. We need measurement systems that are standardized and inform and guide persons in wheelchairs about their physical activity and if they're meeting the guidelines or not. We need evidence-based opportunities that are accessible and sustainable and implemented through different delivery methods, such as telemedicine, in-home programs, and community center programs. And really, to summarize my key recommendations, I think the importance for us is to move beyond focusing on barriers and focus on the successes and facilitators. I think one way to do, to do this is longitudinal research tracking the experience of people that use wheelchairs in their physical activity journey. My slide outlines in more detail five specific recommendations, but in summary, we need to further develop our physical activity guidelines. We need to change the way researchers think about wheelchair use and comorbidities. We need to engage a larger fraction of the population in the research. We need to make sure we have an evidence base to support the measurement, technology, and methods for avoiding injury for wheelchair users. And we need to promote collaborations with key stakeholders. And in summary, Oops, sorry, challenge with my slide here. In summary, um, you know, physical act activity should never seem unattainable for people that use wheelchairs. And the path to meeting physical activity goals for persons that use wheelchairs should not be so hard. As wheelchair users, we should have access to the same level of information, the same level of resources that people without disabilities do, and we're not quite there yet. We have some work to do. So I want to thank NIH for hosting this workshop and even rescheduling it with COVID. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this workshop and to be an advocate for this work in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Um, at this time, we are ahead of schedule, so I felt that we might have an opportunity to open up the, um, the workshop to questions from the panel. And if we have any questions that have been provided in the Q&A pod, we can address those questions now. So yes, I will ask- Hi, Ms. Wisniak, can you hear me? Yes, hi, this is actually to, to Kerry Morgan. Thank you for a great presentation. One of the things, and I realize your study is an N of one, but one of the issues that, that we are also tackling is uh, what are the risks of, of physical activity? And, and, you know, you being sort of in that category of, I would say, elite athletes, uh, you know, you kind of listed out very nicely the, the benefits, right, for you personally of the N and one. What do we need to know about the risks of physical activity? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And it's something that, you know, I've, I've had quite a long journey here. And as I get longer into my journey, I definitely have serious concerns about things such as my shoulder health, um, you know, maintaining um, the integrity of my shoulders so that I'm able to use them in my everyday life, but also for my competition. And so I, I definitely focus on these things in my training to make sure that I'm addressing them. So um, shoulder health is a big one. Um, skin integrity is a big one. So I'm changing my position a lot, whether I'm going to my rugby chair or I'm going into my racing wheelchair. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm putting pressure in different places and just need to make sure that I'm not creating any problems. Um, and, you know, the other one is that I don't fully sweat. So things like overheating when I'm training, um, uh, and things like that are, are definitely concerns that I've worked into 
um, you know, some of my uh, routines. And I think this is why it became really important that I needed somebody that was educated in not just physical activity, but in disability that could sort of help me regulate um, and, and hopefully minimize some of these risks. And I just listed a few examples, but, um, you know, I think your point and, and dependent upon, um, I think there's variability in the population of wheelchair users, but, but there are some things that definitely need to be negotiated and managed um, when people are doing physical activity. Thank you. Do any of the other panel members have questions? This is Jerry Gerwitz. Let me do this. Let me just ask each of the panel members if they have a question, just so everybody gets the opportunity to speak with Kerry. Um, and thank you for that terrific presentation, and inspiring presentation. So, Noel, do you have any questions for Kerry? I think the, the one thing that um, I was just curious about is I know you mentioned early that physical activity is widely recognized as having health benefits, even for people in wheelchairs. And as somebody who's been, like, just delving into that literature, do you have any uh, – I haven't seen a lot of that literature in wheelchair users. So I just wanted to sort of ask for your perspective, especially as an OT in that arena. Yeah, I do think that we have um, some room for improvement <laughs> in the literature to make the case stronger. Um, but there definitely is studies out there that are showing um, links or, or impacts of um, potential benefits. And, and, and they span from, you know, people that are physically active potentially falling less, people that are physically active um, having better balance, people um, physically active um, do have the ability to improve their strength. And so, um, you know, I think where we probably need improvement is maybe some rigor in the studies, maybe some larger populations, maybe more longitudinal work following people with disabilities. I, so I think there's a start to it, um, and, and I think a really good start indicating that if people do engage in physical activity in proper ways, that there are health benefits and very clear ones. But I, but I do think that, you know, this is one area that I don't think our research is totally conclusive yet, um, and I think we need to build it. Daryl? Any questions, Daryl? So let me go on. Well, audio is not, there it goes. Okay. He needs to unmute. There All right. Uh, uh, we, can hear, we can hear you. Um, Terry, uh, one, I just want to first thank you for um, just such a wonderful um, presentation and, and congratulations on um, both being an elite athlete and, and, and a wonderful and great researcher, too. Um, I have uh, two um, questions. One, you, you, you told us of, about an N of one, but obviously you have, have interacted with both other um, elite athletes as well as amateur athletes in 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 um the kinds of uh, activities that you have um uh, been involved in both within the rugby and um with racing um so um could you just give us a sense as to um how um um representative your N of one is based upon your conversations with these other um, athletes that you've been working with and playing with? Yeah, so I try to pull out themes of things in my journey that I thought were fairly representative of folks that I've um, either interacted with or worked with through research. Um, I, I do think that, you know, and I mentioned it early on, I think there's just a lot of variability um, in our population of wheelchair users. And I think people have different experiences, whether they've grown up with their disability um, or not grown up with their disability and they did physical activity um, before their injury um, or their health condition and now they're trying to return to physical activity. Um, people have different function levels. So, you know, I, I think some of the themes and the barriers um, 
that I shared and some of the motivations and some of the goals are similar, but I think some of it's going to present differently for some people, um, you know, dependent upon some of these personal characteristics um, that are out there. So I guess to answer your question, I, I think it's somewhat representative, but I think we have to acknowledge the fact that, it, you know, it's going to be a different journey for everyone. Mm -hmm. And and uh, um, in terms of you, in one of your recommendations, you said that uh, you wanted researchers to sort of change their perspective on wheelchair um, use. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think often, you know, and, and especially in the greater physical activity literature, I think sometimes, you know, using a wheelchair is seen as sort of as a negative. Um, I think it's sometimes used as an exclusion criteria. Um, and I, I think we have to stop thinking about it as a negative. Um, you know, I really view my wheelchair as something that helps me be a really independent person. Um, and so I think, you know, the way that we approach it in our research and making sure, you know, Allison talked about it, um, that in our research we're not noting what people, what equipment people are using, how they're using it, why they're using it, what's the fit, what's the, it's just not um, mm -hmm. Um, documented. And so I, I think we just have to change sort of our perspective that it's not a negative thing. It's a really important thing for a lot of people, um, and they're not going to be able to do physical activity without it. And so how do we understand that, include it in our research, not make it an exclusion criteria, and better document it? Thank you. Kirsten? Well, thanks for your very interesting presentation. Um, I had a question actually more along the lines of the physical activity guidelines. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what your thoughts are about the current guidelines for people with disabilities, how the community of people with disabilities have reacted to this, and what you would ideally want to see in guidelines um, in future iterations that we could be honing in on now. Yeah, so that's a great question. And honestly, um, you know, Part of the research I do is we educate people about the exercise guidelines. So from my experience, most people with disabilities don't even know that there's extra exercise guidelines out there that are specific to people with disabilities. And so that would be my, my, my first comment to you is, is I, I don't think people with this, many people with disabilities, um, anyway, a lot of them that I work with even know they exist. Um, you know, I think the, the second part of it is that, um, you know, I think that we just need to do better. <laughs> I, I don't, and, and, and you know, this is, uh, Allison set this up really well, but um, we don't um, really have very detailed guidelines that are specific to wheelchair users and what it looks like. And so when I look at those guidelines, it's really hard for me to sort of parse out. I, I guess those are kind of close for me and adequate, but, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and I think the other challenge to it is this intensity level discussion. So um, I work with a lot of people with disabilities that do physical activity, but they're not realizing their physical activity goals. And um, when I start working with them a little closer, I'm realizing that they're really just not doing intense physical activity. So they're, they're doing the time, but they don't understand what it feels like as a person with a disability to do moderate to vigorous intensity. And so somehow the guidelines need to um, capture, you know, what that intensity needs to look like, what it needs to feel like, and make it more meaningful um, for people with disabilities that are trying to follow the guidelines. Great. Thank you so much. Kelly? Thank you. And that, your presentation was a perfect start to this workshop. And uh, Daryl actually asked my question about uh, continuing to change the way researchers think. So thank you. We just have a few more minutes. Terry, I, I was intrigued by your recommendations and your comments, but I was particularly intrigued by the, the timeline, the long horizon. And I wondered what, what the inference it was from you talking about 20 to 30 years into the future. Uh, are you discouraged? Are you optimistic? Uh, why such a long timeline? Why such a long horizon? 
Yeah, and you know, honestly, I hope many of those things come maybe to fruition a little sooner. Um, I am optimistic. I think there's a lot of positive things. I think this workshop um, and recognize the importance of uh, moving the research or the needle forward in this area is super important. Um, I also think the development of um, technology is um, and it, it is super positive and applying that to people with disabilities, right? So things like um, AI and um, machine learning and um, some of the wearable sensors and, and really getting some of that up to speed um, so that um, we can better inform, collect data, use measurement tools, but um, also just use that to better educate and inform people with disabilities, um, uh, you know, about their health and what they need to do in order to achieve their goals. So I, I am optimistic. I think we have a lot of smart researchers that are, that are motivated and passionate about the topic, um, and I think it's just about getting organized and um, figuring out where our gaps are and how we as a community come together and make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're working as a group of researchers and we're, we're moving the whole picture forward. Um, you know, I, I think all aspects of research are important here. We need to have better understanding of mechanistic um, things. We need to have better um, interventions and we need to translate it better and implement it better. So. Um, so I, I am optimistic. I think I said 20 to 30 years just knowing that, um, you know, research takes some time um, and hopefully by that point that, you know, we can make all those um, things that I discussed come to fruition. Great. Thank you. We are seeing a lot of questions from participants and uh, I just want to be cognizant of, of the time. We were three minutes until the break. Um, so let me just, I'll, I'll just ask one of these questions and, and then if we could close, Terry, that would be great. Um, one of the biggest challenges we hear from families is what you referred to in your presentation, finding the expertise expert professionals with the appropriate knowledge. How can this be improved? Yeah, so um, great question. And, um, you know, I work for um, a university um, and I work for the occupational therapy program. And I think part of it is educating our students um, and educating the healthcare professionals that are coming out. Um, you know, they, they you know a lot about disability. We need to educate them more about physical activity and how to accommodate people. Um, there's many professions out there, right? Recreational therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists. So how do we get curriculum for these students that are coming out um, to get them um, up to speed? So when, if, whether they're working in a rehabilitation hospital or they're working in a community organization, that they have the skills and the knowledge um, of this topic area. So, I, you know, I think that's one way. I think another way um, is, is at conferences, is continuing education um, units for um, healthcare professionals that are already working out there. So I think it's a multi-pronged kind of approach um, in order to do it. Um, but, but I do, I think it's a significant challenge um, having the right people at the right place um, to support people in the right way. Thank you. And, and so thank you on behalf of everybody for a fantastic keynote, and uh, that really gets the workshop uh, off to a great start. Um, one of my responsibilities, I've been told, is to keep things on time. So we are going to end here. We're going to take a break of 10 minutes, maybe 10 and a half minutes, and yeah, we'll resume thanks. promptly. Is that correct, Thank Keisha? You. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gerowitz. Uh, this has been a very robust opening for the workshop. We will now take a 10-minute break, and you can stand and stretch and have a cup of coffee and refresh yourself. Please note that you should see the countdown. We're going to put a countdown clock on the screen, <laughs> and we ask that you please return so that we may begin on time with the discussion of key question one. Thank you.
All right, we're going to get ready to get started. Give everybody a second to join us. So welcome back everyone. Good afternoon and another good morning to all joining us from the Central Mountain and Pacific time zones. I'm feeling a little refreshed. I hope that you are too. So let's dive right back into our workshop agenda. So for the remainder of the time that we have today, we're going to cover key question one. Uh, what is the evidence base of physical act, on physical activity interventions to prevent obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular conditions, including evidence on harms of the interventions in people who are at risk for or are currently using a wheel mobility device? First, we will hear from Dr. Shelley Self, followed by Dr. Deborah Backus, Dr. Robert Modell, and Dr. James Remmer. After all the presentations are completed, Dr. Gerwitz will moderate uh, our discussion and Q&A session. So as a reminder, don't forget to send your questions and comments through the Q&A pod as the pre presentations go forth. And remember to add the presenter's name who should be addressing your question. And if you have any technical difficulties, feel free, our team is ready and available to assist you if you send a message in the chat pod to all panelists. So let's begin. Dr. Shelley Self of the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center will give our first presentation on the topic, Physical Activity in the Health of Wheelchair Users Systematic Evidence Review, Methods and Key Question 1, Health Outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Self. Thank you, Keisha. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm uh, just by way of introduction, I'm a family physician and I've been doing systematic reviews for the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center for over 10 years now. And this is the first of uh, four presentations uh, on this topic of physical activity and the health of wheelchair users. And I just want to say here, because we did get a question about what is, what do we mean by wheeled mobility devices, because you've heard that today already. And essentially we mean wheelchairs. But we also mean um, electronic scooters, that people who may be using a walker but they need to go long distances are having to rely on a scooter. So we wanted to include those as well. Not so much the wheeled walkers, since they're not, not that different from a, a, a walker with uh, tennis balls on the end, uh, more, the, uh, more the wheelchair and the wheeled scooters. Um, but for, for my presentations, I'm just going to use the term wheelchair, and that, that refers to um, all such devices. So next slide. So here is our research team. Uh, Dr. McDonough is the second person there. She is also the Associate Director of the Evidence-Based Practice Center. On our panel, we have specialists in physical uh, medicine and rehabilitation on our team physical therapy, physical activity, epidemiology, systematic review methods, and medical librarian. Next slide. Uh, none of the members of the team have any financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. So this slide will be shown for each key questions, and it's just uh, to let you know as a reminder as to where we are in the process. Today we're on day one with the first presentation. Next slide. Beginning with the introduction, uh, this is a view from our hospital overlooking downtown Portland, and in the background you can see Mount St. Helens. Next slide. So we've already covered uh, this uh, for, with uh, other speakers. We know that a lot of people require uh, mobility devices, that limited mobility increases risk factors for a number of uh, bad health outcomes, and it's also recommended to improve uh, such things as fitness, function, and quality of life. Next slide. Uh, this review addresses the question whether individuals who may be using or potentially using a wheelchair in the future may benefit from physical activity. Uh, NIH chose to focus on these three populations. Um, and uh, this is to represent a, wild, a wide range of potential wheelchair users. For example, uh, we found that in in our, in our review that study participants with MS tended to be adult females, those with SCI tended to be adult males, and those with CP tended to be children and adolescents. So it is a, a fairly wide range there. Next slide. 
Moving on to the purpose and scope of the review. Next slide. So our purpose was to identify, summarize, and synthesize the current evidence on our three populations, as well as to identify any gaps in the evidence uh, where additional research is needed. Next slide. So now we'll look at each of the key questions. Key question one looks at the evidence for physical activity on preventing these undesired long-term health outcomes, such as becoming obese, developing diabetes, or having a cardio or developing a cardiovascular condition such as heart attack or stroke. We were also asked to look at what interventions, outcomes, inclusion, exclusion criteria, and research methodologies were used in these studies of, to prevent the long-term health outcomes. Next slide. Uh, looking at key question two, this is the meat of the report, and which we will cover tomorrow. It looks at the benefits and harms of clinical outcomes, intermediate outcomes. Also, uh, can physical activity reduce the harms of immobility? Next slide. Also, can we, does physical activity decrease the risk for adverse events or adverse outcomes of the disorders? Uh, what are the harms themselves of physical activity? And do the benefits of har or harms of physical activity vary by the location of the intervention, the amount of training, or the level of supervision that was provided? Next slide. Key question three is our patient subgroup uh, question. It looks at to see if the benefits and harms differ based on such patient factors as age, gender, or ethnicity, or do they differ based on whether you had MS, uh, CP, or SCI? Next slide. For key question four, this looks at the methodological weaknesses or gaps that exist in the evidence. What types of studies did we find that supported our conclusion? What are the major weaknesses in study designs? And what could we do uh, to improve the ability of future research to address the key questions? So going forward, what research would, uh, would help us out here? Next slide. Uh, here's the analytic framework that we uh, employed. On the left are your three populations. And if you look just to the right, that first arrow, you see physical activity. So the populations engage in physical activity. Moving a little bit further to the right, hopefully there are positive, uh, uh, positive benefits on intermediate outcomes and positive benefits further to the right on clinical outcomes. But there can also be harms. So if you look at the squiggly arrow coming down from physical activity, we also considered harms. And then to the right of harms, again, we looked at the evidence base for uh, what was available to talk about um, the long-term, uh, the prevention of long-term outcomes. Next slide. Here are our inclusion criteria. We included study participants with the three conditions, uh, and they could be any age. So adults, children, uh, adolescents, older adults didn't matter. Uh, they had to meet uh, the physical activity requirement of 10 uh, exercise sessions on 10 different days. And these sessions had to be supervised by study personnel. So it was not good enough that the caregiver supervised the activity or that a patient reported that yesterday I engaged in some activity that was not good enough. It had to be observed by uh, study personnel. Uh, they could have more than 10 sessions, that was fine. Uh, they could have sessions that were not observed. That was also fine as long as 10 of those sessions were observed. Um, we included comparisons to no physical activity or to other types of physical activity. We included numerous outcomes those that are on the slide here are just some of them. Uh, another slide will go into the outcomes in more detail. We had no requirement that a physical activity session last a certain number of minutes or that the sessions continue for any length of time as long as there were 10 sessions on 10 different days. We included any setting, and that includes home, uh, as long as they were observed by a study personnel. We included randomized trials and other controlled studies that had at least two different control groups, or two different groups, rather. Uh, we also requ required studies to have analyzed at least 30 participants in MS and at least 20 participants in CP and in SCI. Next slide. So here are the interventions that we included. <clears throat> we didn't exclude, set out to exclude any interventions. If they had the, met the included criteria, we included them. 
We did categorize the interventions that we found into four different categories that you see on the left, uh, aerobic, postural control or balance, strength, and multimodal interventions. And multimodal interventions were those interventions that always included a strength component, but they also included either an aerobic component or a postural control component, or in some cases, both. So there were some interventions that had um, strength, aerobic, and balance elements to it. Next slide. Here are the outcomes we included. Uh, there are some that NIH uh, prioritized. Those are in the middle column. For those outcomes, we did conduct strength of evidence ratings, and I'll discuss a little bit uh, more about strength of evidence in an upcoming slide. So we had quite a number of outcomes that we were looking for. Next slide. So I want to take this opportunity to discuss the outcome function. So function can be assessed uh, with scales that have function in the title, such as the gross motor function measure or the MS functional composite scale. But in reality, function is a broad outcome. Um, and then it, it can include elements of walking and a balance of activities of daily living, mental health, or quality of life. And our approach was that when we had a sufficient studies and outcomes to talk more specifically about uh, something like walking, then we talk about walking. So if we had uh, several studies that talked, that uh, reported six minute walk test and maybe another study reported 10 minute walk test, uh, MS walking uh, scale, other walking tests like the 25 foot walking scale, for instance, uh, or walking test, then we could talk about walking. But oftentimes we didn't have enough uh, studies or enough evidence to talk more specifically. So in those cases, where we might have had one small study that reported a balance scale, another small study reported a walking measure, and a third small study reported ADLs, instead of saying we don't have enough information to really talk about those three areas, uh, in some cases we were able to combine those and say, you know, we do see that, that uh, function uh, may tend to be improved with exercise, although it's the different components of function. So when we could be specific, we were. Otherwise, we went with general function. Next slide. So these are some examples um, of the scales that we uh, used for balance, or that we found for balance, ADLs and quality of life. These are not the only uh, instruments that we found. This is just a sampling to give you an idea about when we talk about activities of daily living. These, these are the instruments, type of instruments we're looking at. Next slide. Now to a brief overview of our methods. Next slide. Uh, so in the life cycle of our topic, after it was nominated and after extensive topic refinement, refinement, we conducted our review, and that's what we're presenting to you today. Next slide. We searched multiple databases, and our current searches uh, in the report right now are through mid-June of 2020. We have done an updated search, which is, I guess, now last month in November. Both studies are not in there right now, but will be added to the final report. Next slide. So we use good systematic review methods. Uh, our abstracts and full text articles were reviewed by two reviewers. Uh, we also had a second reviewer double check our data abstraction. So we used good, uh, good methods. Next slide. We rated each study on the quality of that study or on, on what we thought that study's risk that the results might be biased. So good quality studies were those studies that were well conducted, they retained most of their people or all of their people, and also just as importantly, they were well reported so that we knew what the trialist had done. On the flip side, poor quality studies had significant flaws that we judged may invalidate the results, making them at high risk for bias. And just an example, if say you had a study of 30 participants in SCI, 22 of them dropped out and the study's reporting on eight. Well, it may have been a well done study, but they lost so many people that we question the validity of those results, that those eight people represent all 30. And we would give that a poor quality rating. If the study wasn't quite good enough to be considered good quality, 
or, or, or considered to have high risk of bias and be poor quality, we consider that fair quality, which is the majority of the trials, or the majority of the studies. Next slide. We conducted both qualitative and, when we could, quantitative synthesis. We combined studies and a meta-analysis when we were able to do, to do that. Uh, additionally, we included poor quality studies, but then we performed a sensitivity analysis, removing those studies to see if it changed uh, the, uh, the results. Next slide. We also performed strength of evidence ratings on the body of evidence for prioritized outcomes, those that were in the middle column. Strength of uh, evidence ratings take into account not just the quality of the studies that are in that body of evidence. And by body of evidence, I mean, uh, for instance, the, what's the body of evidence on treadmill training uh, in multiple sclerosis on uh, walking? So that would be a body of evidence. So we looked at the quality of the studies that went into that body of evidence, but we also looked to see if they were consistent in their findings. Were the studies actually measuring what we wanted, uh, what we were looking for? What was the precision if we were able to pool and get an effect estimate? How precise was that estimate? Did that estimate um, report both uh, uh, the confidence interval being so wide that uh, significant harm might be done or significant benefit might be done? That's a very wide confidence interval, and we would consider that imprecise uh, and downgrade. So we looked at all of these uh, elements in order to come up with a strength of evidence rating. Next slide. Uh, after looking at it, we rated the evidence as high, moderate, low, or insufficient. So a high strength of evidence rating means that we had a, enough good quality evidence to feel confident that the estimate of effect is true, that new evidence is not going to change the findings. And I apologize because I have a new puppy here. Moderate uh, means moderate uh, uh, confidence in the estimate of effect. Low means low confidence in that we have some consistent evidence, but um, not enough. And we feel that additional studies may change the findings. And insufficient means that we have little or no evidence, or that the evidence is so, uh, so low quality or um, so, we'll just say so low quality that we could not, uh, or so inconsistent that we couldn't draw conclusions. Next slide. Moving on now to the results. So our searches uh, through early summer resulted in 163 included studies. Most are randomized trials, that's the good news. And most of the studies are in MS, followed by CP, and then spinal cord injury. Next slide. Here are the individual interventions in the study populations. Uh, as you can see, some interventions included only one population, such as hand cycling and SCI, while others included all three populations, such as aquatics and balance exercises. Next slide. Here are the results of our assessment of individual study quality. As you can see, most of the studies are rated fair quality. That's the blue bar with few good quality studies in green and a fair number of studies rated poor quality or having a high risk of bias. And uh, when we normally conduct systematic reviews, we expect to see about 80% of the studies rated fair, about 10% rated good, and about 10% rated poor. In this case, we had about a quarter uh, of the studies rated poor quality. So the body of evidence is not quite as robust as we have seen in other systematic reviews. Next slide. This is a reminder of what key question one is. It's looking at the evidence to prevent obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular conditions. Um, next slide. So we looked at the studies that met our inclusion criteria, and unfortunately, no included study assessed the effect of physical activity on obesity, diabetes, or on cardiovascular outcomes, such as heart attack or stroke. We then looked at the, uh, the 942 additional studies that we reviewed at full text. These studies were excluded from our review, typically because the sample sizes were too small, the interventions were too few or not observed, 
where the study enrolled only one group of participants. None of those studies reported these long-term uh, health outcomes either, unfortunately. So this represents one of the gaps in the evidence, uh, a definite gap that will be discussed further uh, when we talk about key question four on Thursday. So if you're looking uh, at the text of the report under key question one, what we did do is we do talk about those included and excluded studies that report intermediate outcomes, such as blood pressure, body weight, blood sugar, uh, these outcomes that are related to the long-term health outcomes, but there truly was no evidence to answer key question one. Next slide. Uh, this is just a reminder that the full evidence report is now available for public comment on ARC's website. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Sims, um, for your presentation. And I hope that your doggy gets happy. <laughs> yeah, I'll happy. make other arrangements the rest of the week. <laughs> Next, uh, we will hear from Dr. Deborah Backus to discuss rehabilitation and exercise interventions to improve motor outcomes in people with spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis. Welcome, Dr. Backus. I'm um, trying to start my video. I seem to be having difficulty with that. Here we go. Hello, and thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for including me in this very important workshop. I'm very honored to be here. I'd like to thank Carrie for um, uh, an outstanding plenary that um, and like to say that I share this passion from a different angle, but I share the passion to help empower people who face some of the barriers of using wheelchairs and um, helping them to achieve the highest quality of life possible. I, I find it interesting to be following up on Dr. Self's presentation because I'm going to be addressing um, this first question. I don't have any disclosure. Oh, I should say next slide, please. I don't have any disclosures and the planners have reviewed the content and I will not discuss any unlabeled use of a product, but I am next slide going to be speaking about um, some evidence related to physical activity interventions for preventing secondary conditions um, for people who use wheeled mobility devices. And I'm actually going to make a claim that there are some rehabilitation and exercise interventions to improve motor outcomes in people with spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis, and that we might, in fact, be able to impact secondary conditions, even if the large body of evidence that they looked at might not suggest that at this time. So we all know, and we're talking about how physical activity, when we don't have enough of it, we increase our secondary, our possibility of secondary conditions. If we increase physical activity, we might be able to decrease secondary conditions. And as a physical therapist, I operate under these um, assumptions all the time that I want to be able to help people achieve the greatest level of activity and function so that they will be healthy. And I should say I've been a physical therapist, educator, and researcher now in rehabilitation medicine for almost 35 years. And I have found this to be a challenge. And in particular, the challenge, of course, is for the people that I tend to work with who have very, tend to have significant disability that causes them to require a wheelchair or not, if they don't require a wheelchair full time, require a wheelchair for long distance um, community mobility um, for interaction in their everyday activities. And these are the people that we're most concerned about. What about these people? What can we do for them? How can we help them to achieve adequate physical activity? And you've heard this already, but I'm restating it to tell you how I'm going to make my case. Thank you for advancing my slides. Can you advance them again, please? I'm advancing them on my computer, and I forgot that you actually have to advance them for me. Can you advance to the next slide, please? These people, this, this is, these are the folks that I want to talk about. And what if they're not like Carrie? What if they're not athletically inclined or competitive, and they don't seek out ways to be physically active? What kind of activity do they need? 
what kind of activity do they need to achieve motor outcomes? What kind of activity do they need to prevent secondary conditions? Can they get enough physical activity to prevent or reverse secondary conditions? And actually, what is physical activity? We keep throwing out this term physical activity, but what is it? We define physical activity, it's bodily movement that is caused by the skeletal muscle that requires energy expenditure. So what, how much of this is needed and what can we do for those folks who maybe are not able to ambulate or if they are using a wheelchair, they're not inclined to seek out that physical activity themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So what I want to convince you of is, or demonstrate to you is that people with spinal cord injury and MS who have severe weakness and paralysis may actually have similar potential to achieve physical activity and potentially impact those markers related to obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And I want to consider the idea that physical activity may require different approaches for people who require wheelchair for mobility and can achieve adequate physical activity through walking or upper body exercise. And I want to discuss the potential or consider conducting research trials, as Carrie already suggested, um, that are different from what we traditionally to do, but also that are based on impairments and functional deficits rather than just the diagnosis or underlying pathology. Next slide, please. So when we consider spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis, clearly they come from a different um, pathophysiology. MS is an immune-mediated disease. It's chronic and it's progressive, and the immune system is attacking the oligodendrocytes, which form the myelin. And when we take away this myelin, that affects the neural, neural transmission. We also know that there are um, that there is axonal damage with multiple sclerosis as well, but it's very different from spinal cord injury, which is caused by trauma or spinal cord um, disease in the spinal cord itself. There's still an interruption of the neural transmission, but the underlying pathology is different. The medical management is different, and the epidemiology is different. Furthermore, we know that MS affects not just the spinal cord, but the brain as well. So there are other signs and symptoms that occur as a result of affecting the neural transmission in the brain as well as that of the spinal cord. But we, uh, next slide please. But we also know that both MS and spinal cord injury affect very similar pathways. And what you see here in this figure is you see the pathway that's responsible for activation of skeletal muscle. Starting at the brain, in the cerebral cortex, going down through the brainstem, through the spinal cord. Next slide, please. And wherever we disrupt this pathway, we ultimately do affect the activity in the skeletal muscles. So it might be through multiple sclerosis lesions in the brain or the spinal cord, or spinal cord trauma or disease itself. But regardless, next slide, please. What we do is we affect the function of the skeletal muscle. And what does that look like? Next slide, please. We see direct motor changes, such as weakness, paralysis, that can occur in both spinal cord injury and MS. We see the inability to activate or deactivate muscles in a timely fashion. We see decreased muscle endurance or increased fatigability. And there might be muscle tone dysregulation, such as spasticity or spasms, all of which make it very difficult to move. Next slide, please. We also can see with both spinal cord injury and MS, we know that it's not just this pathway that can be affected, but also ascending pathways controlling sensory um, perception can be affected. There can also be autonomic dysfunction and pain, whether that's neurogenic in nature or musculoskeletal, all of which can further impact the ability to perform movement, activate the skeletal muscle, the right amount at the right time to be functional. Next slide, please. These motor changes that occur in spinal cord injury and MS, as we know, next slide, can lead to functional changes, which can mean a decreased ability to walk. And the vast majority of people with MS will experience impairment in their walking. That may not immediately lead to the need for a wheelchair, but put them at risk of a wheelchair if they don't get enough physical activity, 
if they have too much weakness, paralysis, and some of the other signs and symptoms of MS that make them need a wheelchair. And this also happens in the majority of people with spinal cord injury, whether it's paraplegia or tetraplegia, they may experience impairments in their walking. Next slide, please. And all of this leads to a decrease in physical activity. And this decrease in physical activity just leads into a cyclical pattern of decline and deconditioning, which further impacts and causes functional changes. Next slide, please. So when we think about motor outcomes, we can think about them quite broadly. A lot of times when people think about motor outcomes, they think about just walking. But the international classification of function actually provides us with a conceptual framework where we can connect the health condition to one's abilities to participate in their environment. And we can look at body functions and structures, the physiological function and anatomical structures, the activity itself, which might be walking, being in the community, participation in school and employment. And we know that environmental factors and personal factors can further impact the ability to perform those activities. Next slide, please. When we consider, for instance, community mobility, the health conditions, both spinal cord injury and MS, can impact that. It, and when we consider the motor aspect itself, at the body functions and structures level, we consider that strength, endurance, balance, and coordination can all be impacted. These are all impairments that also will affect the person's ability or capacity to perform the activity. When those are affected, those can be treated through rehabilitation and exercise and improved to provide the capacity to perform the activity. Therefore, hopefully allowing someone to be more physically active. But we also know that there are personal factors such as cognition and fear, knowledge and self-efficacy or confidence that can impact someone's ability to perform community mobility or to participate in the community. Cognition can interfere with dual task performance. Fear can make somebody afraid to be out in the environment and therefore make them at a higher risk of falls. And confidence can make it difficult for them to seek out the help they need to be able to be mobile in their community. And then there are physical barriers and people barriers. Physical barriers, just the structural environment around them, or people and their perceptions of somebody who maybe has limitations in their community mobility. Next slide, please. When we consider people who are in wheelchairs, we know that they can have an impact that being in a wheelchair can impact all of these different domains of activity and function by causing a decrease in their strength, endurance, their motor activities, by having an uh, impact on cognition and fatigue. This can further increase their fear and, in, and decrease their self-efficacy or confidence. And we know that people in wheelchairs can often face even greater barriers in their environment because of structural limitations, curbs, lack of access to different um, environments, and people's biases towards people in wheelchairs. Next slide, please. So when we consider what's available to them, being able to go out for a run or a walk, to ambulate, to get their physical activity is very difficult. Next slide, please. But thanks to technological advances, there are ways that they might be able to increase their physical activity, get bodily movement that requires energy. And so what we see here is some of those opportunities. In the middle, you see that there are ways to do um, exercise by being seated in a wheelchair, whether it's through three free weights or through um, apparatus on the wall. People can participate in Tai Chi or yoga from the wheelchair. In the bottom right corner, there are body weight support systems that might provide for support, taking weight off of the lower extremities to allow them to walk even when they have weak lower extremities or provide when they don't have good balance. We also know that there are now advances in the use of electrical stimulation that might provide stimulation to activate the muscles, to get physical activity in the muscles, and potentially allow them to exercise and build that capacity at the body function level. Next slide, please. 
And you heard, you've already heard um, earlier that there are some associated risks with exercise. People with both spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis can experience autonomic dysreflexia or dysregulation. They might have thermodysregulation or heat intolerance and fatigue, which can be due to lassitude, like in the cases with MS, or due to muscle fatigue. But the literature has shown over the years that people with spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis can exercise. There are ways to manage the autonomic dysreflexia. People can be taught to monitor themselves. There are now um, activity monitors, heart rate monitors, blood pressure monitors that they can use to also regulate and monitor to make sure they're safe. People with both spinal cord injury and MS can be taught strategies to help them exercise safely. There are cooling vests. There are ways to cool the environment. People can um, perform aquatic therapy in cooled pools. And there's a lot of work looking at ways to manage the fatigue. Of course, through ed ed education, but also through interval training, which might give people the opportunity to exercise at greater intensities, interspersed with rest, to allow them to exercise for longer. Next slide, please. So what is the evidence base for physical activity interventions to address obesity, di diabetes, and cardiovascular conditions in people with SEI? Well, let's think about what we know in general. In general, we know that if a muscle is activated and a demand is placed on it, it can be strengthened. In people without nervous system injury or disease, we know that that's true. If we stress the cardiovascular system, it can improve. If a person is more fit, they have better metabolism, we will see improvements in their insulin sensitivity, we'll see healthier weight, and reduction in cardiovascular disease markers. Next slide, please. Is that true in people with spinal cord injury? Do they have the potential? If they place a demand on their muscles, can they improve? If they place a demand on their heart, can they? And there is a lot of literature in people with spinal cord injury demonstrating that if they exercise, they can get improvements. And I'm just providing a couple of key ones here. Mark Nash and his group, Pat Patrick Jacobs, many groups have looked at exercise in people with spinal cord injury and shown that circuit training, resistance training, people can perform those activities safely, they can improve, meaning they can increase their resistance, they can increase their endurance and exercise time and get benefits in cardiorespiratory responses, in their lipid profiles. They can increase their training intensity to improve their physical capacity, their lipid profile, profiles and insulin sensitivity, affecting markers of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And arm cranking exercise has also been shown to lead to those changes. What about people with MS? Next slide, please. If we look at these same contrite criteria, can they in fact improve? And for a really long time, it was believed that people with MS, and actually that was very interesting to see the previous presentation that there was more literature in MS. Um, there is more literature, but for some reason, there still has been this, um, this uh, belief that people with MS cannot safely exercise, and that if they do exercise, they won't get the same benefits. But there is literature out there, next slide, suggesting that people with MS can successfully strength change with resistance, uh, improve their strength with resistance training, and they can increase their VO2 peak with intense ergometry. Interestingly, the things I was looking for um, in the literature are really were related to these markers for obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular um, disease. And there's far fewer, um, uh, far less research in that area in people with MS. A lot of the research has focused on looking at safety and looking at neuroplasticity and changes in function. But nonetheless, people have been able to use upper extremity exercise, whether it's resistance training or endurance ergometry training with spinal cord injury and with MS to get improvements that indicate they may be able to impact things like markers of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. You've already heard about these um, so other associated risks a little bit, but from Carrie, where she said her, her shoulders are starting to get a little bit creaky. Putting an increased demand 
on muscles that are already being used for mobility in people who, for instance, use manual wheelchairs, obviously puts them at risk for other musculoskeletal consequences and pain. So it's not that that means they shouldn't exercise, but that we need to be finding ways to support them and providing for the equipment that's necessary and the training that's necessary to minimize those consequences. Furthermore, there's the risk of fatigue in smaller muscles of the upper extremities, and less, less than fatigue or more than fatigue is the consideration of that. If those smaller muscles do fatigue, if they are being used, will we get an adequate exercise response? to really impact things like obesity and the, the markers for diabetes and cardiovascular risk. And of course, there's this issue of preference. You know, if people want to do it, then we need to find a way that they can do it and they can do it safely and sustain, sustainably over time. Next slide, please. But what about if people don't want to exercise that way, they're not motivated to do it, what if they have a situation where their upper extremities are too weak to get an adequate exercise response? And what if we want to get a bigger bang for our buck and we want to exercise the large muscles? Because the large muscles, exercising those large muscles might give us a bigger bang for our buck in terms of lipid profiles and um, uh, glucose intolerance. And there is some literature related to people who are still able to ambulate, who can maybe use um, body weight support, treadmill systems, they can maybe walk in those systems to get the exercise that they need. But I really want to focus on those people who are really weak, who maybe can't get that activity through their upper extremities, who, and who can't activate those large muscles by themselves. How can they exercise? And what does that response look like? One of the technologies that is really, um, that is that has been around for a while, but seems to always be advancing is the use of electrical stimulation. And what these pictures show you is on the left is a system called a functional electrical stimulation cycle or bike, whereby the muscles are stimulated using surface electrodes to propel the ergometer for cycling. Now this one here happens to be one from restorative therapies, but it's the one, and it's the one that we have for our research. It's the one that our patients use, but I'm not, by no means am I promoting it. There are other cycles from um, MyoCycle or Cyclone. There are other companies who make bikes that have this similar kind of activating the, the muscles of the legs to get that functional movement of cycling. And on the right is surface stem, electrical stem, used for um, exercise of single muscles or or multiple muscles, but in, not in a functional movement, but in this case for knee extension, and it can be used for resistance exercise or endurance exercise. So what is the literature related to the use of these technologies for people who are very, very weak? Can they improve in their ability to use their muscles? And if they do do that, are there changes in motor outcomes? And are there changes in these markers of secondary conditions? Next slide, please. And in fact, there's a large body of research in people with spinal cord injury demonstrating that, one, they can cycle using the FES cycle. They can perform FES cycling anywhere from a few minutes up to an hour. And they can improve in their how long they can cycle over time, the resistance they can take during cycling. And if they do those exercises, it has been shown that they can improve their glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. They can affect positively impact their muscle metabolism. There are changes in their weight and increased lean body mass, decreasing the impact of obesity. They can also impact their vascular system and their cardiovascular health and their cardiorespiratory system. There are some associated risks. One is that people with different levels of injury don't all respond in the same way and may have different responses in terms of their autonomic system. They, there might, because people in wheelchairs may not be putting weight on their limbs, they are at a higher risk of decreased bone mineral density and therefore fractures. And because if they aren't active and they aren't getting movement of their limbs, they're at increased risk of contractures. So it's really critical that they get the activity that they need. Next slide, please. You might ask, can you get the same um, impact with um, just the e-stim? You can, except that 
Even though you can impact the muscle and mitochondrial function, you cannot improve factors associated with insulin resistance or glucose tolerance, whether that's with resistance or endurance training. Next slide, please. Hi, Dr. Backus, this is Keisha. I just want to interrupt to say that we are over time for your presentation. Is it possible for you to wrap it up? Yes, please. Um, um, I will, um, if you would, go to the next slide and then I'll just wrap it up. People with um, MS can also experience these changes um, and safely exercise with FES cycling. And so therefore, people, they have the capacity for change. They may not always be, um, it may not always be at the level of function and walking, but they can get impact from the physical activity that may therefore improve their health and their wellness and affect markers. And so I would advocate for the fact that both might be able to be studied together and that we might utilize in a, um, a research um, methodology that will look over time in this patient population to see what the long-term effect might be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Backus, uh, for sharing that rich information on how to improve motor outcomes. Uh, we're now going to have um, Dr. Robert Model uh, with a presentation on challenges and opportunities for the design of exercise interventions for wheelchair users. Welcome, Dr. Model. Thank you, Keisha. So, first of all, thank you for the opportunity for being involved in this workshop. Next slide, please. I have no information to disclose. Next slide, please. So, um, the, the title of this workshop is Can Physical Activity Improve the Health of Wheelchair Users? And I think we all would imagine the answer is yes. But I think we should also learn from our past experiences for, for optimizing future impact. And so, I was tasked with discussing challenges and opportunities for the design of exercise interventions for wheelchair users. Now, next slide, please. Now, much of this talk is gonna be based on multiple sclerosis. And I think Dr. Self uh, uh, found similar results to what Byron Lai found in this uh, systematic review in that the majority of the research on exercise interventions in people with disabilities has been conducted in individuals with multiple sclerosis. So there's a rich knowledge base to learn from. Next slide, please. And I was part of this international group where we looked at the literature on exercise in persons with multiple sclerosis, and we found that there were many mistakes made, uh, many challenges and many limitations in this literature that really provide uh, substantial barriers to translation and implementation of of knowledge into clinical practice. Next slide, please. These are the six main challenges and, and, and issues that we identified that really represent opportunities for future research. These are heterogeneity of outcomes, sample representativeness, samples without problems, a research design continuum, uh, mechanisms of benefits and adherence and sustainability. And by addressing all six of these in future research, it should improve translation and implementation of knowledge into practice and, and care. Next slide, please. So I'll start with heterogeneity of outcomes. Next slide, please. So when we look at the literature on exercise and multiple sclerosis, we can see that there are benefits of physical activity behavior on MS pathogenic processes, body structures, including central nervous system integrity, body functions, activities, and participation outcomes. Next slide, please. But this meta-analysis offers us some really important insight into the effects of exercise training on different outcomes in multiple sclerosis. So this is a meta-analysis of exercise training effects on fitness in multiple sclerosis by Matt Plata. And in this meta-analysis, there were 10 randomized controlled trials of exercise training effects on aerobic power measured by uh, peak aerobic uh, capacity. And what uh, Matt found was that there was a half-standard deviation improvement overall in aerobic power from before to after exercise training compared to control conditions. 
But when you look at the figure on the right of the slide, you can see that some studies actually show detraining, which is the top study. Some studies show small effects as you move down this, this figure, and some studies show very large effects. So although there's an overall mean change, there's substantial variability between these individual studies in the degree of, of change in, in fitness outcomes. Next slide, please. Beyond study level heterogeneity, there's substantial individual level heterogeneity in response to exercise training stimuli. So this is a paper by Jess Baird where she looked at individual level heterogeneity in exercise training studies involving persons with multiple sclerosis. And this figure here are data on inter-individual variability in peak aerobic power in response to aerobic exercise training interventions, and these are waterfall plots. And what these plots show is that with arm ergometry, rowing, or cycle ergometry, that some individuals actually show detraining with the same aerobic exercise training stimulus. Some individuals show no change or very small changes with this exercise training stimulus and some individuals show very large improvements in aerobic power with the same exercise training stimulus. Next slide, please. Now, we see this with other outcomes as well. So these are data on the six-minute walk on the very left-hand side of the screen. And again, we see that some studies show a reduction in walking performance. Some study, or some individuals have a reduction in walking performance. Some individuals have a slight improvement in walking performance, and some individuals have very large improvements in walking performance, again, with the exact same exercise training stimulus. And the figure on the right shows that this extends into fatigue and depressive symptoms as well. Again, the idea is that some individuals show very large uh, improvements in fatigue or depression, whereas other individuals show no change, and some individuals will actually show worsening of fatigue and depressive symptomology with the exact same exercise training stimulus. Next slide, please. So when we think about this, there's substantial uh, heterogeneity and individual level responsiveness with exercise training interventions. And we need to think about the factors that might come into play, whether they're genetic factors, environmental factors, or phenotypical factors of the chronic disabling disease or condition that all might result in differential responsiveness. And this is important as we move forward and we start to design research trials and we think about uh, adaptive research designs and things along those lines so we can identify exercise programs that optimize the effects in wheelchair users. So next slide, please. So another major issue is sample representativeness. Next slide, please. So these are recent data published on the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in the United States. And one main finding that can be seen in, in these figures is, is not new or surprising. That is, multiple sclerosis is far more common in women than it is in men. Now, the surprising finding from these prevalence data are the age distribution of multiple sclerosis. We used to think that MS was most common in young and middle-aged adults. But what we're finding is that there's a demographic shift, that MS is most common in individuals 55 to 64 years of age, and it's becoming even more common in individuals 65 to 75 years of age, and those 75 years of age and even older. Next slide, please. Why is, is this a potential problem? Well, we need to look at the demography of our diseases and make sure that we're including the, the right people in our trials so that we have research that's generalizable back to those individuals. So in this review by Byron Lai, if we look at the column for multiple sclerosis, we can see that the mean age in all of these studies is 46, whereas we see the mean age now of multiple sclerosis is in the mid-50s. So we're not matching what MS looks like. We are matching what MS looks like from a biological sex perspective in that uh, these studies include a ratio of three to one uh, women to men, which matches. But when we look at race and ethnicity, we see that the majority of the research includes individuals who identify as white and Caucasian. There are very little inclusion of individuals who identify as black or African-American, despite the fact that there is substantial increase in multiple sclerosis in that segment. 
of the population. Uh, also, we see that many of the individuals who enroll in these studies have a college degree, if not higher. Next slide, please. When we further drill down, we see that the average disease duration is only 10 years. And we see that most people in these trials have relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. So we know very little about the effects of exercise on people who've had the disease for a longer period of time, which often portends transition into a wheelchair or in more progressive courses of multiple sclerosis that again portends into wheelchair uses, usage. And lastly, when we look at disability status, we can see that most of the individuals in these studies have fairly low to maybe moderate disability, indicating that they don't actually have walking limitations yet. Um, and, and that, again, presents major problems with translation of this knowledge um, into uh, those with wheelchairs or who use wheelchairs for mobility. Next slide, please. One of the uh, most outstanding problems is that we know that comorbidity is quite common in multiple sclerosis. When we look at cardiovascular comorbidity, we see very high rates of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and heart disease, and we see metabolic disorders such as diabetes. And so we know that comorbidity is common, but we screen these individuals with risk factors out of the research. And so our research is really only applicable to individuals who don't present with comorbid diseases and conditions. Again, challenging the representativeness of our research for the population of interest. Next slide, please. So another major issue is that many studies include samples without actual problems. So for example, if they're studying the effects of exercise on depression, they don't actually recruit samples with major depressive disorder or elevated depressive symptomology. Next slide, please. So this is a meta-analysis by Brent Adamson illustrating that point. She looked at the effects of exercise on depressive symptoms in adults with neurological disorders and diseases. She found 26 studies that met inclusion criteria, and when she looked at those studies and the degree to which they screened for depressive symptomology or not, she found that the vast majority, 20 out of the 26, did not screen for depressive disorder. So they're studying the effects of exercise on depressive symptoms in people who actually don't present with depressive disorder. And that's going to create major problems with floor effects and being able to uh, actually uh, study whether or not exercise could be an effective treatment for someone with major depressive disorder. Uh, with this in mind, uh, next slide, please. My colleague Brian Sandroff and I went back and, and reanalyzed and performed a secondary analysis of some data uh, on a physical activity intervention for fatigue and depression in persons who actually had elevated symptom status. So we went back into the data and we pulled out subsamples that had fatigue or had elevated depressive symptomology to look at the effects of this physical activity intervention. What we found is that the effect of the intervention on those with fatigue was about three quarters of a standard deviation, which is a somewhat large effect. When we looked at those with elevated depressive symptomology, we found that the effect was one and a quarter standard deviations. So the lesson to be learned here is, is that if we want to actually make inferences regarding the benefits of physical activity for treating a, a condition in persons with who use wheelchairs, we need to make sure that we're recruiting uh, these individuals and that they actually have a problem that's a focal problem that we seek to study. Next slide, please. So another major issue involves research design. Next slide, please. So oftentimes, researchers are not starting out with qualitative research designs. And so they're not starting out with person-level voice. And I want to highlight this research by Stephanie Silveda, who she conducted a qualitative study to inform the design of an exercise program for persons with multiple sclerosis who use wheelchairs. And so she interviewed 20 individuals with multiple sclerosis who were wheelchair users, and she uh, came up with a exercise program that included understanding the context, whether it was community-based or home-based, the prescription, including the mode, frequency, duration, intensity, 
and outcomes of relevance. And this research is important because it, it will inform uh, the design of an exercise program. It will inform uh, what's going to come next. Next slide, please. Uh, feasibility studies. And we need to think more about feasibility studies that allow us to look at whether or not we can actually do the research and what it takes to do the research, uh, such as if and how an intervention can actually be done, looking at recruitment rates, looking at retention rates and eligibility, uh, looking at research site capacity. You know, more and more we, we, we tend to bite off more than we can chew. And if we did feasibility studies, we might actually uh, better understand what it is that we can undertake. That will better inform pilot studies, that will inform efficacy and effectiveness uh, trials. Next slide, please. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this was a nice feasibility study by Yvonne Learmont that was testing the ability to deliver an exercise program based on the guidelines for exercise and multiple sclerosis. And, and the feasibility data on how to actually do the study resulted in a uh, funding for a phase three trial on a comparative effectiveness of supervised versus tele-rehabilitation exercise programs, and it's greatly informed the capacity for that trial to operate smoothly. Next slide, please. We need to know a little bit more about mechanisms of action. Uh, if we move to the next slide. This is a, a framework that was put forth by Brian Sandroff, Aaron Barbe, Ralph Benedict, and John DeLuca, who are major players in the area of, of exercise neurorehabilitation. And what they wanted to do is put together a framework for how exercise training might result in behavioral changes in mobility and cognition. And they believe that this works through what's called the primers model, the processing integration of multi-sensory exercise-related stimuli to result in brain system-related changes to get behavioral outcomes. And things that we often think about, such as molecular and cellular changes, really are the scaffolding that allows uh, the primers model to unfold. Next slide, please. So this is what the primers model looks like in the top part. We know that exercise involves ongoing sensory input and output. Information is coming from the periphery into the brain through the thalamus, being relayed to other areas such as the hippocampus, visual cortex, prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, motor cortex, and somatosensory cortex, and creating output to regulate exercise behavior. The adaptation part is the primers part of the model. When individuals first start engaging in exercise behavior, this process is very inefficient. As they adapt over time, it becomes more efficient and even more efficient to where we have a very efficient uh, central nervous system process for explaining adaptations with exercise training. Next slide, please. The last thing is adherence and sustainability. Next slide, please. Despite all the evidence that we've gathered on exercise benefits in persons with multiple sclerosis, we know that people with MS engage in substantially less physical activity than the general population. It's about one standard deviation lower. Why is that so important? Well, we know that the general population to begin with is not very physically active, and so it's a very low bar, and, and uh, people with MS are substantially less physically active. I suspect that this extends into uh, other populations uh, as well. Next slide, please. And so we have a lot of opportunities for promoting uptake of exercise and long-term sustainability of exercise. And what we've learned from multiple sclerosis patients is, is they want information on exercise promotion from healthcare providers. They seek information on what they can do from neurologists, nurses, PTs, OTs, and other healthcare providers. And we've learned from providers that they have a strong interest in promoting exercise behavior in persons with multiple sclerosis. And so this provides the nexus of the patient provider interaction for promoting physical activity and exercise behavior change in persons with multiple sclerosis and likely other uh, 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 diseases and conditions that cause mobility disability. If we go to the next slide, please. So from this, we came up with this, this model. That at the end, at the top of the model, we seek to change exercise behavior. We want to shift the distribution of individuals who are inactive into those who are physically active. And that occurs through the center part of that model through an interaction or a consultation 
between a patient and a provider. So the foci of this opportunity is better training our providers in physical activity guidelines and information. And so we know that there are guidelines uh, for spinal cord injury. We know that there are recent guidelines for physical activity and MS across the spectrum that the National MS Society has put out, looking at those from who, who including those who are wheelchair users and helping uh, our professionals understand these guidelines and then giving them information on how to overcome barriers and optimize facilitators for exercise behavior change. Next slide, please. Now, these are just six major uh, experiences and, and limitations, but I think we can substantially move the needle. We can move the field forward, but we have to be mindful of, of these sorts of issues and lessons learned as we address the challenges in promoting physical activity in wheelchair users for optimizing their health. And that's the end. Thank you, Dr. Model. Uh, these have been some great presentations today. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. James Remmer, who will share his screen with us so he can discuss lifespan, longitudinal outcomes, exercise guidelines for people with cerebral palsy. Dr. Remmer, are you there? Yeah. Your audio isn't connected at the moment, so we can see your mouth moving, but we cannot hear you. Um, to connect your audio, go down to that menu at the bottom. Um, there's probably an audio options button. How about now? Yep, much better. Okay, great. And, and then if you just click, uh, we can't see him yet. We need you to click that share screen button. Uh, How about the share now? is no? at the bottom, bottom of your window. Okay. Uh, it's probably coming up. Let me do it again. Okay, I think it's coming. Yeah, it's coming through. Coming through. Okay. Looks good. All right, thank you. Uh, well, thank you everyone for inviting me to this uh, workshop. I'm really excited about the possibilities that can hopefully uh, serve as an outcome of where we need to go as, as, as a group of researchers who are in a very specific, iconic area focused on ensuring that people with disabilities are given the opportunities, you know, not only to improve their health and to be participating in various types of clinical trials and studies, but also what I'd like to do today is think about, you know, more of the bigger picture on where do we go from here to ensure that the kind of work we're doing in a clinical setting or in a laboratory really gets to be translatable, you know, in community-based settings. So with that, I have no information to disclose. I have no cats or dogs. I wish I did, so you won't hear any animals behind me, uh, but it was great to hear. Um, Shelly's uh, dog, I think this is uh, just the nature of uh, the current climate we're in, and obviously pets are wonderful, so um, hopefully I'll have one soon. Uh, the outline today is really looking at three basic areas, and I'm, I'm going to try not to sort of repeat what the systematic reviewers are doing, but really look at, you know, this whole area of cerebral palsy has kind of been diminished in terms of the, of, of the amount of research that we have in comparison to populations such as multiple sclerosis and even spinal cord injury. There are some studies, and I'm going to present those today, but I, I do think that we need to pay a bit more attention to people with cerebral, cerebral palsy, and in particular look at, you know, how do we start to track and monitor people, you know, over uh, their lifespan. So the three areas of the presentation really deal with, again, I don't know who's on the call, so I'll just to give you a little bit of information about the demographics and the function functional levels of people with cerebral palsy, and then we'll get into the ex effects of exercise, and then finally talks about, talk about the gaps in research. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways to slice the types of cerebral palsy that people are typically classified in uh, uh, having, but essentially there are four major types, spastic, which is the most common type, uh, dyskinetic, which sometimes is called aphetoid CP, 
ataxia, which affects more of the balance center in the brain, the cerebellum. And then finally, this fourth type is a kind of a mixture or a combination of the other three types. The other way that people with CP are typically classified is by the limb level of involvement. So there's something called diplegia, which is more involvement in the lower and, and less involvement in the upper. And then there's hemiplegia, quadriplegia, where all four limbs are affected equally, and then also monoplegia. The typical way that researchers will identify within a group of people with cerebral palsy uh, levels of, of function, and this is important because there, are, there is such a wide range that sometimes what you'll see is there, there's a greater range of functional level in one group compared to looking at, you know, different populations and clustering people, you know, in a way that would uh, align more so with their function. So there are, there are, you know, quite disparate levels of function in people with cerebral palsy, and these are typically noted by the gross motor function classification system. So you'll see this a lot in the research, and I'm sure the systematic reviewers saw this as well, that typically when a researcher conducts a study, you know, they'll focus on, you know, these different levels in identifying and describing the functional levels of their cohort. Now, I just want to go over two slides because we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but as you know uh, from my, the title of my presentation, I, I was asked to do lifespan, longitudinal, look at outcomes, and maybe even talk about exercise guidelines. So there's a lot packed into that title, uh, and, I, and I really uh, am grateful uh, for whoever decided to give me it, but I can't really get into the details of all of it today. So these are slides to think about, you know, where do we need to go as a workshop um, and a group of researchers that really want to look at how can we improve the health of people with cerebral palsy and also how can we protect them from various conditions such as heart disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, you know, the, the, the question that we were asked to address in this session really relates to, you know, preventing some of these chronic diseases. So very quickly, what you'll see here on the left slide is this is uh, the population of, of uh, individuals with cerebral palsy from ages 10 to 25, and it's showing you that at age 10, children who had difficulty walking, unsteady walk, or needed to use a wheelchair, versus the right side graph, which shows children who did not need a wheelchair at age 10. You can see across a 15-year period, there was a significant decline in mobility uh, in the population that began at age 10 using wheelchairs. And I bring that up because, again, our focus is really looking at either people who are at risk at some point in their lives for transitioning um, into an, you know, a piece of assistive technology like a wheelchair for pot or full-time use, or also looking at those who are already in a wheelchair and, you know, what are the potential trajectories of health in someone that, you know, um, is, is in this condition. So I think what this is showing you is basically that over time, those who currently use a wheelchair at the beginning of this longitudinal study you know, had higher rates of mobility decline um, in the 15-year period. And then this is kind of the same thing. I'll just focus on the left hand. You can see this is a trajectory of children from ages 10 months to 60 months, and it's also broken out by GMF, CS, those five levels. And as you can see, you know, the bottom two levels, which are GMF, CS, 4, and 5, uh, have a significantly different trajectory of mobility than uh, the first three levels, GMF, CS, 1 to 3. So, you know, these, this is obviously statistically significant and, again, raises the question that across the lifespan, even at a very young age, you know, are there interventions that we can do to decrease the slope and the differences between these populations, these subgroups of people with cerebral palsy? Uh, this particular site is very unique. It's, it's done by a couple of colleagues of mine, Ed Hurwitz and Mark Peterson, both at the University of Michigan, have done some outstanding work in addressing uh, cerebral palsy and exercise. But this study essentially shows that individuals who are uh, categorized as obese uh, have a higher rate 
of, I'll use the term comorbidities, than individuals with cerebral palsy who do not have, um, who have not been identified as obese. So it's, it's, it's really telling because as we start to think about, you know, the importance of reducing obesity rates in people with cerebral palsy, you can see that those who have higher rates of obesity actually have, um, you know, greater risk of various types of chronic conditions, prehypertension, hypertension, uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia, osteoarthritis are all higher in the subgroup with uh, obesity. This is a quick snapshot of physical inactivity in, in individuals with cerebral palsy. And I just want to highlight that over a 25 year period, not much has changed. The rates and the prevalence of inactivity, you know, seems to be consistent over a 25 year period, unfortunately. But what is interesting about this slide is it's showing that in a study by Stevens et al., where we broke out the data from age group four to 10 and those who were 10 to 18, you can see, uh, according to these effect sizes, that they are dramatically different. Uh, the individuals who fell into the 10 to 18-year-old category had much higher rates of physical inactivity disparities compared to their uh, age match peers compared to the children. So there may be something going on here. Again, this is all cross-sectional, so we don't know for sure, but there may be something going on where as that individual gets uh, older and there are more um, opportunities to participate in the general population in sports, particularly competitive sports, uh, children, youth with cerebral palsy, you know, do not participate as, uh, as frequently. Uh, and in these next couple of slides, I'm just very quickly going to give you a snapshot of a paper that just came out in December of 2020. It was headed up by Byron Lai. Um, and it's basically looking at the literature to identify where there are gaps in this whole area of what we refer to as leisure time physical activity. Um, it was a, you know, your standard scope and review. Uh, Byron ended up with, you know, starting out with 426 studies. And at the end of it, you know, he um, uh, ended up with only uh, 49 studies that were considered uh, high quality, good to high quality and were randomized controlled trials. The good news is that there are incur there, there is encouragement from the standpoint of a growth in RCTs. You can see in 1999, there were just a couple of RTCs involved in just children and adults. Many of these studies, uh, not many, but a few of the studies actually combined adults and children. And as we get into 2016 to 2019, you see that now there were actually 26 studies that uh, you know, targeted this area of leisure time physical activity interventions, that is, in children and adults with cerebral palsy. But strikingly, there are just really uh, six studies, one between 2011 and 2015, and uh, five between 2016 and 2019 that actually focused entirely on adults. So we need to think about that as we go forward uh, in this workshop. And this is just kind of a snapshot of the RCTs reporting favorable outcomes. Again, the big difference here is that there's a lot more um, information and data and outcomes on those uh, higher functional levels, which do not necessarily involve individuals who use wheelchairs compared to the right side, which is your GMF, CS levels four and five, predominantly wheelchair users. I should note that in level one, of the GMFCS, there are individuals who use wheelchairs, uh, usually for longer term ambulation or community ambulation. So that does have a subset, but the subset is very small. Intervention types by GMFCS, um, as we've heard from several of the investigators today, there's a range of interventions that have been conducted on people with cerebral palsy, so it's very good strength, aerobic, even active video gaming, et cetera, et cetera. But again, when you separate it out by those who use wheelchairs, um, you know, less information and less data on this cohort. Targeted outcomes in RCTs by function, you know, fairly good range of targeted outcomes, the predominant one being musculoskeletal um, outcomes were the predominant um, outcome targeted in this population. 
and then you can see less and less studies as you move, you know, from left to right of the graphic. The intervention types by age, again, you know, we, we were focused a, a little bit more on trying to identify studies for adults, and what we ended up with was a predominant database on children with cerebral palsy, and there were just a handful of studies that you can see in these green bars that really applied to adults. And the same thing here, targeted outcomes in RCTs by age group, just a handful of studies smattered across uh, this range of outcomes that were primarily focused on adults. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the studies related to children didn't have uh, a few people who might have fell into the adult category, but if that was the case, the adults were generally younger in age, usually under 30. And so here's just a summary, RCTs by age group, you can see that there were 42 studies involving children under the age of 18, five adults, children studies, combination of both, but again, more so, um, more children than adults, and then of course there were two studies that were specifically focused on adults. Um, you can see the mean age there, um, the two studies that focused on adults had a mean age of 40, but interestingly, you can see the sample size is quite different for the adult group, and uh, the total sample size per group among adults was really only eight, um, so very limited, and there may be reasons for that that I'll try to get to at the end of the presentation. Um, I was also asked to look for, you know, are there any exercise guidelines, physical activity recommendations for people with cerebral palsy, and there, there are guidelines. Uh, they were published in 2016, and they were based on uh, several different sources of information with a particular focus on randomized control trial. So uh, that was all good. And I can see my time is getting close to the end, had about four minutes, so let me just keep going. So our question for this uh, session was really to look at what is the evidence base on physical activity interventions to prevent obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular conditions. And sadly, there are very, very few studies, as you heard earlier from the systematic reviewers, that uh, really focus on this. However, there was one study that was published uh, in the Netherlands, and it was actually a very good study. It was a randomized controlled trial. They tracked, uh, again, a very young population, mean age, 20 years. They had a sample size of 57, um, had a control and an experimental group, and they found fairly good outcomes, short and medium-term effects in peak oxygen consumption, basic circumference, again, all markers, of obesity and potentially coronary heart disease. And in the long-term effects, they had a reduced skin fold sum, lower systolic blood pressure, and lower total cholesterol. So there actually is one study that looks promising. Obviously, we need to consider using this as a platform or a foundation for continuing to examine uh, the working cardiometabolic outcomes in people with cerebral palsy, particularly those who may fall into uh, middle age and older adulthood. So in terms of the knowledge gaps, I'll just kind of summarize by uh, leaving you with these thoughts. Obviously, you know, we need interventions that are more inclusive of people with cerebral palsy who use wheelchairs. Um, we need interventions that can efficaciously or effectively improve physical activity participation, and in particular, address what the question is, which is, you know, can we impact these cardiometabolic outcomes? We need some way to look at long-term sustainable post-intervention outcomes, and we also need to consider, you know, how to make our interventions more scalable and enjoyable. And of course, you know, many of you probably heard that, you know, implementation science is a translational piece that's supposed to pick up from where we leave off in the clinical side of this. And, uh, you know, NIH is really focused on trying to figure this out because, you know, they don't want to see, you know, clinical studies or laboratory studies never get out, you know, into the community. So this is an example of a statement made by NIH that even when you do have good clinical trials and you achieve positive outcomes, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to um, actually work, you know, in different local contexts. So these environmental factors could have a huge impact on, um, you know, what you're going to try to replicate out of a clinical setting in a community-based, uh, more natural setting. Uh, we also need to consider 
how we systematically adapt efficacy trials. You know, we do that in our National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability. But, you know, we, we often hear people say, you know, oh, I adapt, I adapted my study and it doesn't necessarily work. So we need to be able to gather information on how do you adapt these trials. So very important to think about adaptation done in a more systematic manner where we can look at the built environment, equipment, the kinds of services we offer, and also the instructional strategies that are used so we can maintain some sort of database on these adaptations. Um, intervention developers need to address issues of fit within the service delivery system because, again, we're going back to that earlier comment, when we get to implementation science, um, it just doesn't necessarily work out to our favor. And then finally, leveraging resources. I think that the key issue here is, you know, we've got millions, billions of dollars going into looking at obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Many agencies are funding studies but their exclusion criteria often prevents people from dis with disabilities from participating, in particular those with cerebral palsy. So we need to begin to think about how NCMRR can sort of support supplemental matching funds, perhaps an R21 or an R03, to allow, you know, more of a parent grant to work closely with a disability researcher who wants to apply these innovative new techniques or strategies you know, in this area of chronic disease prevention. So I think that's, you know, given the limited amount of resources that all agencies have, but in particular NCMRR, it might be really neat to think about ways that that funding or some of that funding can be used to support researchers in the disability space who would then work closely with experts in heart disease, obesity, or diabetes. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there so I don't encroach on anyone else's time and just say thank you and uh, wish we could have done this in person, but I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Remmer. Thanks for that great presentation. Uh, we're now going to invite all of our key question one presenters to join the discussion and Q&A session that's gonna be moderated by Dr. Gerwitz. So to all the participants, thank you for sending your questions through the Q&A pod. We will continue to receive your questions throughout this session. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Gerwitz. Uh, you may begin. Thank you, everybody, for those great presentations. Uh, very information-packed and informative. So I am going to start by working through our panel members, and I just want to give our panel members a heads up so they know when they're going to get their chance. So just so you'll know, I'm going to start with Kelly and go to Noel, Kirsten, Daryl, and Boris. And as you um, make your comment and ask your question, uh, just indicate who you're referring to first so they can get themselves set up on Zoom and ready to go. So let's start off with Kelly. And my first one is general. Uh, it's an observation. So the charge to our panel was to wheelchair users for the physical activity guidelines that were released in 2018, there is a focus on those with chronic health conditions and adults with disabilities, recommendations for them. And then I noticed that the presenters all focused on specific conditions. So when there was an intervention, you know, it was an intervention for those with CP or SCI or MS. And not necessarily combining those users together into our wheelchair user population. So I just wonder if then our recommendations moving forward, what that implication is, because we are charged with the group wheelchair users, and yet what we've heard differentiates the type of user. I could respond to that. I don't. Um... I don't know who you were, oh, there's Rob. I don't know if Rob, you want to go first? <laughs> if I could know you. <laughs> um, I actually, I was hoping to make that case. I apologize, I ran out of time. No matter how many times I practiced, I, I ended up going over. But I, um, 
I wanted to make that case, actually, that we should look at impairments and functional limitations and not always just at the diagnosis. I think that it's important to consider that, for instance, spinal cord injury and MS, there are important differences that might help us to modify. But what we're learning from our work in MS, which for, in my case, really built on my work in SC spinal cord injury, is that people with MS can also respond to these interventions in a way that's safe and be beneficial. And I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we always stay in those silos. But one of the reasons we stay in those silos is because depending on, on the funding agency, we can get criticized or dinged, if you will, for not being specific to a diagnostic group. <clears throat> and that is, and in fact, how many researchers as they're coming up through in the rehab medicine world is stay focused, stay focused, stay focused in this particular arena. And so it makes it a little bit of a challenge. So I think there's a, a couple of different things going on there, but I would agree and think that there are, there are opportunities here um, to, to kind of do some careful groupings and then consider how to modify. Kelly, this is Rob Model. I think it's um, a really good and, and, and insightful question. Um, that is, can we create a generalized physical activity guideline, um, or do we need to have disease condition specific guidelines? And and my, I think the answer is a combination of both. I think we need to have a generalized guideline but conditions, uh, disease specific kind of considerations, if that makes sense. And, and I think that that would build off of what uh, Debbie Backus was saying uh, quite well. And, and I, I, I would point out that I, I think that there, there was a recent paper out there that looked at physical activity prescriptions uh, for MS, um, stroke, and Parkinson's disease, not the same conditions or diseases that we're talking about today per se. Um, and, and I think that when you look at those, the prescriptions are actually very similar in nature with slight nuances. Um, but then when you look down deep into, th there are some differences in, in what you need to consider for multiple sclerosis versus Parkinson's disease. Th does that kind of answer your question? It does. It does. I appreciate both of your responses. Um, and Rob, my second question is actually for you. So one of the gaps that you nicely described was related to generalizability. And as an epidemiologist, you know, I have to ask, are there representative observational studies of these populations? And has there been consideration for having some sort of registry? For example, if there's not. Yeah, so I, I can't speak outside of multiple sclerosis when it comes to registries. I think uh, uh, maybe Jim or Debbie could talk about SCI or, or, or CP. In MS, there, there is a, a, a major registry in the United States um, that has tried to gather uh, high quality data from as, as many different segments of, of the MS population as possible to be able to track trajectories, including physical activity behavior. Uh, they've, they've done that in different ways. I think they've run into lots of challenges because it hasn't been a large scale funded effort. Uh, the, the registry is called NARCOMS and, and Kelly, I can get you more information off that offline if you'd like. Um, but, but I think that when they, they, rolled out NARCOMS because it wasn't a funded effort, they have found, and, and this is just my understanding from speaking with Gary Cutter, that the individuals who kind of enrolled in and signed up for NARCOMS have, have not really represented well the, the global population of MS. Mm -hmm. there, there's another registry through I Conquer MS, and, and mm -hmm. Debbie might be able to comment more on that than I can, but I think they're they're running into the same problems. Is is that people who volunteer for these kind of efforts aren't necessarily the same people, and we face that in research all the time, right? The people who volunteer for our studies, we get what we get sometimes, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I guess my point is, is that there are large uh, uh, observational studies in MS. Um, I'm not quite sure that the samples in them are going to be as generalizable of what MS looks like as we would like. Yeah, this is Jim. If I can maybe just jump in. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with a very low incidence population like cerebral palsy, 760,000 people spread across the country, I do think that you know having some way to look at a question dynamically versus statically. You know, all of our studies are sliced over a period of time based on the funding and also you know the limited amount of data that we can actually gather with that, that funding. So I see the opportunities here, but I also caution that when you get into the disability studies community, they're very nervous about this thing called registry because, you know, it's sort of what's the purpose of a registry and what are the implications of being included, you know, in a group. The second part of that is that many people, uh, you know, they just don't want to be part of a registry just for looking at the trajectory of their health. They want something to come out of it. So I think if we term that we use here, and Rob's heard this term, a cogistry, which is really something that looks at a cohort that would actually have the opportunities to participate in research, and we could do that now with the technologies available to us, where we could do group training at home and we can help people transition into community. I think that would be really something for NIH to consider going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. If I could add another um, thought is that uh, the model systems, the NIDLR model systems might offer an opportunity, something to leverage to get some of this data because those, those are large longitudinal data sets. And um, I can't tell if somebody's trying to, trying to speak or I'm hearing an echo, sorry. But those are large longitudinal data sets that if we could somehow um, get that, you know, leveraged and use that information or maybe add on data, you know, sometimes they will, each cycle they have additional trials that can be run out of centers where we collect some of this kind of important information that would be useful. And that's different from a registry. People are, are put into these, you know, based on being patients at mo as the model system. So that is an opportunity that I think we aren't necessarily getting the most out of, where we could learn a whole lot more about what's going on with um, physical activity and intervention. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. We want to give the other members of the panel a chance um, to ask some questions. Noel. The first question is for Dr. Rimmer. So obviously a lot of what you presented is in CP. Um, and I feel like from the other populations, we haven't heard a lot about kids, uh, pediatric populations and wheelchair users um, in spinal cord injury or uh, for pediatrics. And so I was wondering if there's anything you think um, from CP that we could generalize when we were thinking about other um, clinical conditions, but focus specifically on children, because I, I feel like we've not heard a lot about kids other than what we know in CP. And what Rob Model said earlier, I think we need both studies, right? We've got to look at are there differences, you know, from a mechanistic standpoint or a functional standpoint between groups with different disabilities. But more importantly, and I didn't get to this, and I actually talked to Deb Backus about this, you know, we've got to go back to that ICF where we could start to look at functional level. So the data that I see on children with cerebral palsy, because we're looking at five different functional levels, you know, really should hold for other children with disabilities. Thank you. And I Noel, I, just one quick comment. There, there is a group uh, in Canada led uh, by Ann Ye at the Hospital for Sick Children that is really focusing in on exercise and physical activity for pediatric onset multiple sclerosis. Um, so th there is a, a, a burgeoning, you know, it's, it's kind of just coming to the surface body of research out there. But I, I think people are recognizing what you're saying, the lifespan perspective. And then my, my other question is sort of ripping a little bit off of what Kelly already asked. Um, and Dr. Backus, I'm gonna start with you. So, you know, 
focusing on conducting trials on impairments or functional de deficits and not diagnosis, and you've already had a little bit of discussion about how um, it, about why both aspects are important. But you know, where should we start if if we're going to sort of try and shift the paradigm and focus more on impairments and functional deficits as a starting place? Um, how do we do that in a smart way that allows us to generalize, but also draw conclusions based on the different the different characteristics of the different samples? I feel like it's the million dollar question in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I would first start to say, I may not know the perfect answer for that, but I don't think that would take away from the importance of looking at those things, right? Because if somebody doesn't have the capacity, then they won't be able to do those larger activities. So um, I don't want to take away from that importance, but I think it comes back to um, combining and leveraging and doing longitudinal studies where we can look at both the building the capacity and looking long term. A lot of our research is very, um, very similar to uh, the management of chronic disease, and it tends to be very episodic when, in fact, a chronic condition and these things that we're talking about are not episodic, right? So our research is that, you know, four weeks, there's a change pre or post. That doesn't answer what you're, that's not going to answer that question because it's going that these interventions have to be ongoing. They take time. There needs to be certain thresholds that are achieved of capacity to get functional changes. And so I, I, I think different models, as everybody has said so far, of um, and incorporating standard outcomes across the studies are what's going to move us forward. Um, right now we're doing, you know, different people are looking at different pieces for different amounts of time, and we're not using a method that kind of brings it all together. Does that address what you're asking? Um, and I, I think, I guess, I think more, just more broadly, like, where should we start? Like, what, like, if you were to start today in trying to answer these questions, where should we start? And that could be for anybody who's presented. I think Jim's talking, but he's muted. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a study that, uh, you know, was funded through the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability. It looks at 53 young individuals with disabilities across the country who have participated in Girls on the Run. And our center can't really do research, so we're looking at just basically evaluation outcomes. How did the children feel about being integrated into a community-based program? So from my perspective, I think we've got to go from the back end to the front end and from the front end to the back end, but I don't see a lot of research that's actually getting into the participation side, the community-based side. So I think we've got to look at that perspective as well. Any other comments before we give the other panelists a chance? Um, okay, Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess I have two two key questions. Uh, the first is that there, from what I'm seeing, there's, there seems to be um, very few um, people from minority backgrounds included in the studies that are being presented. Now, I'm wondering, you know, if there's any, if there have been any sort of major efforts in this direction to to recruit minority. Um, people from minority backgrounds into these studies, and, who, you know, are there examples of groups that are doing a really good job in this respect? To say everybody. I, I think, Kirsten, the, the answer, uh, or the silence has given you part of the answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> that is that I don't think anybody has really made a concerted effort um, I, I know of two small efforts where where um, uh, Dom Kennett Hopkins, who's at Northwestern University, has tried to create exercise programs that are racially uh, tailored for individuals with multiple sclerosis who identify as as Black African American. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I wouldn't call it a huge effort that's born uh, a lot of fruit at this point in time. But but in the world of MS, I think that that's a large part of, of what's been undertaken is that, that minimal research by her. Um, 
Okay. Hi. And then my other question, if um, people don't have other things to add there, is that um, a common topic coming up is the need for um, sustainable programs. Um, and then I thought that Jim's suggestion of uh, you know, leveraging implementation science was a very interesting question, um, suggestion. I see a lot of challenges there um, in terms of the current status of research, um, you know, in a, in a number of ways. The low incidence, so you, you don't have heavy clustering of people in certain areas. Um, there appears to be little focus on the providers um, and the organization providing these services. Um, and then a lot of the research presented is very quantitative. So there's a lot that's very different um, from implementation science. So I'm wondering if there are any frameworks out there that, to guide how this might happen. Because um, it doesn't, I completely agree that this would help a lot, um, but it seems like there are many steps that are needed to get to the point where you can really solidly integrate implementation science. I guess this is more a question for, for Jim. Jim, did you have a comment or a response? Did you hear the question, Jim? Oh boy. While we're waiting for Jim, I would comment that there there is um, a, a growing framework for um, implementing exercise and physical activity promotion through healthcare providers in the context of multiple sclerosis. Um, the 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 National MS Society has has funded uh, the, the the qualitative research to to kind of set up for that foundation and that framework. There are conceptual models for how it's done. Um, and there are even practice level models for how you would integrate neurology, uh, nursing, PT, OT into that um, kind of system. Now, it hasn't been subjected into uh, clinical trials at this point in time to know whether or not it's, it's feasible and efficacious. But I think, you know, kind of some of the new research that's coming out on these hybrid uh, uh, type 2 models, type 1 models, would really support research looking at efficacy and implementation concurrently, because that's what those those new models and research designs are all about. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it's ripe. Yeah, I agree. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was actually responding to an email uh, from a question I received, but, but uh, for, for you know, as director of the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability, you know, we, we have access to literally thousands of people who come to NICPAD for questions related to their health or to find a, an exercise video. I would love to see, you know, that filled in with potential research opportunities in this area of implementation science that would allow us to start to track people and conduct interventions in different community settings. You know, at the end of the day, most people who participate in exercise do something that they enjoy. They might go out and cycle or run or walk with a family member. So we do have to figure out a way to bring people back in to the physical activity ecosystem. And so, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think starting from that end of it and then bringing researchers into that space, you know, we can start to build out the questions from the best practice all the way to the systematic research process on the front end. I'm going to move on to Daryl now. Thank you. So first, I'd um, like to just thank the panel for uh, their presentations and uh, found them very, very thought provoking. I wanted to probe a little bit more about this this notion of, of sort of how um, patient factors might influence um, the outcomes. And so I was a little intrigued by I think it was uh, Deborah, your um, the model that you put up, uh, um, and the factors with regard to um, to fear um, um, in terms of people um, cogn cognition, those kinds of sort of patient level factors that um, you you sort of listed. And so I was it was. Initially, sort of thinking about things having to do with sort of the usual suspects, you know, demography and 
and um, socioeconomic factors. Um, but um, um, I'm just curious as to whether you think, uh, as we're sort of thinking about patient level of factors, should we be thinking um, more broadly in terms of sort of these kinds of, uh, of factors having to do with cognition, fear, um, um, that potentially are, are more important or uh, that researchers should be thinking about when developing their studies and measuring these kinds of things? Thank you. That's a great question and one that is always on my mind. And actually, one of the reasons why um, I collaborate with Professor Rob Model um, is because of the approach that he's developed based on the guidelines for exercise in people with MS. He combines behavioral uh, social cognitive theory to help facilitate behavior change because mm -hmm. oftentimes things like self-efficacy, self-confidence, and fear are huge limiting factors that people don't know. They, they know the guidelines are there, and I think Carrie mentioned sometimes people don't know the guidelines are there, but then there are the cases where they know the guidelines are there, but they have no idea how to approach it. They have no idea how to overcome those barriers, and we have a large uh, multi-site trial um, that's uh, looking at how can we, if we combine this social cognitive theory and we provide the education and the support to people with MS, will they do their exercises and does it, will they do them whether they do them in their home or in a facility and get the same kinds of outcomes? Um, and we're finding and hearing, you know, I can do this for the first time because I know what to do when I'm tired. I know what to do when I face this bar barrier. Now I can exercise in my home. So they are very significant variables. I had one instance where I enrolled a patient, a participant in a trial who was using a wheelchair. She was enrolled in that trial because she required a wheelchair for mobility. It was an FES training mm -hmm. trial. She showed up for her first session late. I said, why are you late? She said, well, I was, you know, after you guys put that stim on my legs and I could feel my legs, I thought, oh, I might, might as well try walking. I felt like, oh, my legs are actually able to move. So I was down on the track and I was walking around the track. And I joked and I said, well, we, we did it. We got the outcome we wanted in one <laughs> session. But it was because she felt confident to do that. So I think it's really important. It's a very, there are very important variables that we need to consider. And, and I know Rob could speak to that even a million times better than I just tried to do. <laughs> did a great job, Debbie. That, that in terms of uh, the, the race information, I, you've answered the question with regard to minorities, but what about the uh, low income people, low education um, persons? Why aren't, why aren't those, those persons appearing in, in studies? I just, uh, if I could just jump in here, Daryl, I, I don't know mm -hmm. that they're not participating. I just don't think researchers are tracking that information. You know, it's not part of mm -hmm. the you know, the uh, intake form or, you know, whatever patient histories they're completing. But I'm, I'm, I, w I would guess, this is just a guess, you know, that there's probably a range of participants, you know, at different levels of function. I can't speak for um, ethnic or minority status, but certainly I would, I would venture to say that, you know, there's no limitation or restriction, you know, on, on age group or I should say educational level. Mm -hmm. Any in insurance information or, I mean, so that would be the other way to get at SCS. Yeah, I, I guess um, just thinking back to some of the reviews that are out there that characterize the, the, the patient populations, I, I have a little bit different interpretation of, of the samples that are included. I, I do think that they are more well-educated, and I do think that they come from a slightly higher uh, income status, which would lead me to be, believe that their their higher socioeconomic status. Um, I, I think that that there might be a number of barriers. I don't know exactly what they are that that might limit the actual opportunity and flexibility for individuals to be able to, uh, you know, because we have to remember research is voluntary. It's something that you have yeah. to choose to do and have the time, means, and resources to do, and I, I think those those things present some challenges. I think that's what you're alluding to. Yeah, 
from a child standpoint, uh, just a little pushback on, on Rob's comment. I think you're right, Rob, for, you know, adult populations. For children, a lot of them are being recruited through the school system or through community-based uh, organizations that service people with cerebral palsy. So it's a little bit easy to get them involved in research because typically they're recruited uh, in settings where, um, you know, they're participating, you know, with other children. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Boris. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. It great presentations. And it's, you know, we realized that our group, and we've had some internal discussions within uh, the, uh, the panel itself uh, regarding both question number one and question number two, which is overlap, right, of benefits and risks. I know we're delving into question two more so tomorrow. This question really uh, goes, I think, to Deborah uh, more so to anybody else. But I also want everybody else to sort of chime in on what's the future of, for example, um, as opposed to active uh, active activities, is the idea of passive stimulation. And specifically, I was intrigued with the idea of electrical stimulation of muscles as being, you know. Uh, an alternative approach to looking at benefits of exercise. Uh, one to Debbie is a question is, is this a, a further blossoming area of research? Uh, and to the whole panel is, are there other such innovative approaches, right? When we talk about individuals who are, uh, for example, you know, with, within the, the, the world of wheelchair bound individuals or those with the diseases that we've talked about, other innovative approach short of, you know, getting out and, and actively working? Are, are, are there things in the future that we should be looking at? So um, that's a great question. And actually, in terms of the technology, the use of FES, um, whether it's delivered with cycling or walking or just for resistance exercises, that's been around for a while. Um, and there is a fair amount of research that's coming out. Now, that has it I think it can be better. We need to do more research in larger populations, so on and so forth, the, all the limitations we talked about. But there is evidence it could be beneficial. But to Carrie's point earlier, it's not accessible to people. So, you know, I um, work closely and talk with these companies, um, the ones that I mentioned, and um, one of the things we constantly say is I wish we could get it to more people. Right, so could we get to the point where not only could you go into REI and buy the equipment you need if you, have, if you use a wheelchair for mobility, but could we get these bikes into gyms? Um, could, we, um, could, could we just make it available, you know, at a crunch where there's the corner where there's FES bikes or there's things that are available to people or in community centers where it doesn't have to have an enormous, you know, a huge cost associated with it. These actually, the, the cycles can go into the homes. Those companies now provide them for people in the homes, but it's very, very expensive. So how can we break down those barriers? I think the potential is there. We just have to figure out how to get it to people. And of course, as Rob said earlier, we still have to do the careful trials to see, well, if you put it out there, are they going to use it? But they're there, those tools are there. We just, there's more work to be done to make it more accessible to more people. I don't want to keep talking. I'm sorry. Let yeah. <laughs> I want to clarify. I, I realize I use a, a really bad term of wheelchair bound individuals, and I retract that. Oh, that I saw that, and I thought, did I say that? <laughs> I got yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Karen, for for noticing that. And again, that is a huge problem. Is both the the terminology we use, the 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 words that we use in order to sort of present limitations. And to the others, are there sort of other approaches that we should be looking at, sort of innovative looks at the world? Uh, and it may go beyond the realms of this panel because, but, you know, part of what we need to be coming up with is what is the path forward for us to be able to more uh, aggressively answer the questions that are presented to us? You know, what we're seeing right now is, uh, you know, data is limited on many of these factors, or we go back to sort of the anecdotal information. But how can we get more robust information on movement uh, and ways of providing that movement of muscles and of 
Yeah, and, and so, Boris, I, I hear quite a few different questions in your, your question. Um, and, and I would point out um, that, that Rachel uh, Cowan, who will be talking either tomorrow or the next day, recently published a, a nice paper on trying to promote um, free living physical activity, that is, moving as part of everyday life for health and well-being in, in individuals with wheelchair who are, who are wheelchair users, um, with the idea being that it's not just kind of these structured um, uh, device-based exercise programs that can be beneficial, but rather being physically active in the context of the things that you have to do on a, a daily basis. And, and I, I think that that's so important because um, I, I was just reading the other day a, a beautiful paper by Adele Diamond um, talking about why exercise training in, in supervised settings doesn't actually have large effects on cognition and brain structure and function, and it's because it's not an enriched environment. And that physical activity in the real world is more of an enriched environment that actually might promote greater central nervous system benefits and things along those lines. It's just a, a thought to throw out uh, there. Well, um, Ms. Jerry, uh, I want to just ask you a little bit about harms because that's something our panel is supposed to be focusing on too. And a lot of us have this simple-minded bias that uh, exercise is good. Mm -hmm. You presented some intriguing, I thought the slides were a little anxiety producing where you show detraining with exercise training. And that was a little scary to me. <laughs> and uh, would you see the same thing with a group of people without MS? Yeah, so Jerry, it's a good question. And, and it, it, it bothers a lot of people when you show them that an individual who does exercise training for 12 weeks or 24 weeks uh, doesn't experience great adaptations. And I think that's a large basis behind the NIH-funded motor pack uh, uh, trial, where they're trying to understand the molecular transducers of physical activity adaptations with the notion that you can take a very homogeneous population of individuals, give them standardized exercise training programs, and some of them will benefit, some of them won't show any change, and some of them will show detraining. And they're trying to understand what is it that explains those adaptations. And, and it, I think it'll provide a lot of insight into uh, why some people respond positively and other people don't. And that'll help us design these kind of adaptive trials. But it's, it's something, you know, going back to the heritage study and Claude Bouchard's work that, that has been demonstrated for, for at least the last 10 years, if not longer. That, that there's substantial response heterogeneity. Now, you asked about also about risks um, with exercise training. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, we, we did this review a few years back looking at the risk of relapse with exercise training in, in people with multiple sclerosis because there was this idea floating around for a long period of time that if people with MS engaged in exercise, it might cause them to have a higher rate of disease activity i.e., you know, relapses. And what we found is actual evidence for the contrary of that, but the, which was kind of surprising and, and interesting to us. But the other really disturbing part to that was that people were not very clearly and systematically reporting adverse events. So I, I think that, that you're going to find, as you look at the literature, that we don't know enough about adverse events because our trials, A, haven't been large enough, they haven't been long enough, and people haven't adopted a framework for really uh, documenting, uh, categorizing, and reporting adverse events that would help us really understand the risk profile. I also respond to that, Jerry, real quick. I know that you're watching the clock, but you're going to have the last word. So. Oh, my. Okay. Well, I really feel passionate about this last word. So I think it's really important to remember, I appreciate and I the work that's been done and looking at the detraining. 
But any single one of us who did not stay physically active and did not exercise and did not do things, we would lose the benefit, right? These people who are using wheelchairs who may not right now have a cure for that, for being able to walk again, I don't think it makes sense to think of them not needing it at some point in time. It makes sense that they will need to continue to exercise, and if they continue to exercise, they can get the positive benefits. It's not an episode of care because it's a, you know, these are chronic conditions, maybe not chronic diseases like MS, but chronic conditions that to think that they could do it and get long-term benefits without continuing it, it doesn't really make sense. And so I think what Rob said about, you know, and what Rachel's going to talk about incorporating into lifestyle, doing the work that Lakeshore is doing and providing accessible um, opportunities are going to be really critical. Um, so that's but Rob wants to get the last word. <laughs> oh, no, I, I just I want to make sure that that I clarify. I agree with what you said. You know, if yeah. you if you stop a physical activity program, exercise program, the benefits aren't going to stay. But what's different is that these are looking at changes from immediately before to after an exercise training program where someone actually did have a high level of compliance and adherence with the program, and yet their aerobic power declined right. in a substantial yeah. way, which is a different phenomenon. And that's more of the phenomenon of how do we figure out the right program for the right Hold person on. to get the right adaptations, if that makes sense. Right. Yep. This has been a fantastic discussion and wonderful presentation. So now I'm going to turn it back to Keisha, who is going to tell us what to do. Keisha, are you on? I'm so sorry. I was talk. I was talking, but muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this has been a um, productive first day for our uh, P2P workshop on physical activity and wheelchair users. Thank you, Dr. Gerwitz, for moderating and to everyone for this dynamic and engaging workshop and discussion session. So first I want to remind everyone that the uh, EPC draft systematic evidence review uh, is live and available for public review and comment. You can access it via the ARC link that is listed here on this slide and we'll also post it in the chat. Um, and there is a comment uh, form that you can actually complete as well that's going to be in the chat there. But before we end today, I would like to cover what to expect for tomorrow. If you already registered for day two, you should have received a reminder including the link for the workshop. So we, we ask that you please join us by 10.55 a.m. Eastern time so that we can begin on time. We will cover key questions two and three. If you're not already registered and would like to join us, please register for day two uh, at our uh, P, uh, P2P website and we'll post that link also um, in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions about the workshop today, a, regi uh, a registration question or a technical question, please send it to our email at uh, nihp2p at mail.nih.gov. And I just wanted to ask if there are any other closing remarks for today. Dr. Girl? I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Thank, thank you, everybody, for your presentations, for your comments, and keep those chats coming. Yeah, so thank you all for an excellent day, and we will see you tomorrow at 1055 Eastern Time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.